Namrata, you're on. Uh, welcome uh, everyone uh, to this international webinar, uh, which is uh, being done by All India Ophthalmological Society along with the IRSI. And uh, this is a webinar which is on endothelial keratoplasty. And we have a galaxy of speakers uh, with us uh, today. And uh, we have uh, eminent uh, speakers like uh, Professor Catherine Colby from uh, 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 from the Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Science, University of Chicago. Uh, she's also the president of the Konya Society International. We welcome her uh, to this webinar. Then we have uh, Professor Benny Jain, who's the professor and chair of uh, Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences, University of Maryland School of Medicine. Welcome, Benny, again. Uh, we had him yesterday also, and thank you for being here today again. Dr. Elmer, too, a very good friend of ours, uh, who's uh, very well known to us in India, and he's the director of Cornea and External Disease Service uh, Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences, uh, University of Illinois at uh, Chicago. Uh, then we have uh, uh, Professor Sophie Dang, uh, uh, who would be joining us soon, and uh, she's from. Uh, she's with us now. She's with us, so she's uh, she's from UCLA, Los Angeles. Dr. Ashwin Agarwal and uh, Dr. Susan Jacob, who are from. Uh, uh, Agarwal Group of Hospitals at Chennai, and Dr. William Berry, who's from uh, Eye Consultants of Atlanta, again from USA. We have eminent uh, panelists with us, uh, which includes uh, Professor Mahipal Sachdev, who's uh, the Chairman and Managing Director of Center for Sight Group of Eye Hospitals and President of the All India Ophthalmological Society. Uh, Professor Terry Kim, uh, who's uh, from Duke University School of Medicine, uh, at Durham, USA, uh, Professor Vishal Janji uh, and Dr. Rajesh Fogla, who is from uh, Apollo Hospitals at Hyderabad. Uh, we also have uh, our chairs, uh, uh, Dr. Amar Agarwal uh, from the Agarwal Group of Eye Hospitals. And thank you, Amar, for coordinating this uh, webinar. And uh, Professor Rajesh Sena, who is the treasurer of the All India Ophthalmological Society and professor at uh, RP Center, along with uh, me, myself. So uh, uh, I would first request uh, the president of All India Ophthalmological Society, Dr. Mahipal Sachdev, to say a few words before we commence the uh, webinar. Mahipal, unmute. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Namrata uh, Sharma. And uh, it is indeed a pleasure to welcome all the foreign faculty, especially from US, to participate. The audio is uh, audio is audio is not you yes. can't hear me now it's okay sir okay welcome everyone to this uh, uh, to this webinar where we have a lot of foreign faculty especially from the US and uh, on this uh, uh, webinar that is going to talk about lamellar corneal drafts and I uh, welcome you all to this particular webinar I think uh, we will learn a lot from this regarding uh, the uh, keratoplasty, the new advancements that are there. And uh, I think uh, Amar uh, uh, on behalf of IRRSI and uh, Dr. Namrata on behalf of AIOS have been very, very active in uh, arranging this whole thing. So I think without much ado, we should uh, start with this webinar. And uh, there are lots of us who want to hear the experts in this particular field. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much uh, for that uh, welcome. And I now request our first speaker, Professor Catherine Colby, President of the Konya Society International, to, to give her talk on DSO tips and tricks. Uh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Okay, of course this worked when we tested it. <clears throat> no, Catherine, get your yeah. presentation on, then press it's share on. screen. Yeah. Now, yeah. Now can sharing. Now, now wait. Yes. Now yeah. I'm seeing it right now. Just wait. You, you can click on the presenter view down. Slide yeah, the show. Bottom, the bottom. Uh, down. Uh, right at the bottom. There's a. Yes. And then it goes away. Uh, hit escape. Hit escape. The end of the slide. So just just go front back. 
No, hit escape first because you're at the end yeah. of your. Click program. on the first slide. First, click on the first slide and then go to slideshow. Yeah, click on one and then click on slideshow. Perfect. It has to be magnified, I guess. Please yeah. do the screen share. Here we go. Okay, sorry about that. Perfect. Okay, uh, greetings everyone from Chicago. Uh, it's a pleasure to participate in this webinar, uh, really uh, the wave of the future in the coronavirus era. I'm going to talk about decimated stripping only and give you some uh, tips for success. I don't have any financial interests in this presentation. I will discuss some off-label uses of rock inhibitors. So we've known for about eight years that the corneal endothelium in Fuchs dystrophy is capable of self-regeneration. And these were shown both uh, by isolated case reports and uh, laboratory work. Uh, the, uh, since 2014, there's also been demonstration that simple desmetorexis, removal of the central endothelium in Fuchs dystrophy without replacement of the graft with, with a graft can lead to corneal clearance and a reasonably good cell count of about 1,000. Shown at the bottom of the screen is my initial DSO patient who was done uh, over six years ago, uh, and he maintains 20-20 vision, a cell count of about 1,000, and a nice clear cornea with 20-20 vision. So my first tip for success with DSO is to pick the right patients. This will only work in diseases like Fuchs dystrophy where there is some endothelial reserve. It will not work in pseudophagic bolus keratopathy where the endothelium has been depleted. Uh, it's, uh, you need to limit it to people with central gutte, uh, no more than five millimeters in diameter. And the, the best results occur when patients have a preserved peripheral endothelial mosaic. Uh, we measure uh, using our confocal uh, superiorly. And if we see a cell count of about 1,000 or more, uh, we know that they're likely to do well. You also need to consider that after you remove the endothelium, that the vision will be blurry for approximately three to six weeks before uh, the patient's endothelium uh, heals in and detergesses the cornea. So for people for whom that would be uh, a problem, you want to just consider doing a, a standard EK. And then finally, patients need to be willing to have an endothelial keratoplasty if the decimase stripping is not successful. So I limit this to patients who have symptoms, not just patients who have gutte. You want to avoid monocular patients, patients where the Fuchs is too advanced, such as those with limbus to limbus gutte, uh, patients who expect perfection, uh, occasionally, we, we achieve perfection with this procedure, but it uh, should not be an expectation. And then again, patients who have no symptoms. The second tip is to optimize your surgical technique. Uh, we do know that gutte uh, appear to be toxic to the endothelial cells in laboratory models, and so you want to try to remove as many of the confluent gutte as you can, although you do not need to remove every last uh, gutte and um, you can leave some and the endothelium can still migrate around, but as, remove as much confluent areas as you can. It's important to be gentle with the cornea. If you dig into the stroma with, for example, a Rosinski hook, this will cause postoperative stromal scarring. And while this is not generally visually significant, uh, it makes the surgeon unhappy to look at it when you uh, see the patient after the surgery. Uh, work from Mass Ioneer really showed that a smooth edge chair increases the success rate of the procedure and it makes sense. So you want to try to have a smooth tear technique rather than leaving a lot of tags of decimates. And then um, Greg Maloney has uh, shown that to center the decimatorexis on the visual axis will lead to reduced optical aberrations. So here's a short surgical video. This is in real time. Uh, and I've marked a four millimeter central area, uh, which um, encompassed this patient's gutte. And I'm using here the Gorovoy forceps. They're a smooth tip, round uh, edged forcep. You can see like a capsulorexis, sometimes you can't get it the first way you try to pull and I go back and pull the other way. And this is um, 
you just re-grab as necessary. It creates a nice smooth edge and uh, it's, it's easy to control. But there are lots of ways to do this. Uh, for, for a number of years, I used the reverse Sinsky hook, taking care to not dig into the stroma. People use an IA. You can use other forceps. The end result is a nice uh, smooth tear, and you can see here. So this is a four millimeter, um, no, uh, no tags left. And this was in real time. Uh, this part of the video is about 50 seconds. So my final tip is uh, to use a rock inhibitor after surgery. Again, this is not FDA approved. Uh, there are several available around the world approved for glaucoma. We have our first one in the U.S. now, uh, Reposidil, uh, which is approved in Japan for glaucoma. We know that these agents have effects on the endothelium and that they promote both endothelial proliferation in vitro and corneal clearance in animal models. And again, Greg Maloney, uh, who's been one of our uh, innovative colleagues in this field, was the first to show that it could rescue two slow to clear DSO patients in 2016. Uh, since then, there have been uh, a number of investigator-initiated trials that are currently ongoing. One that's been published so far is by Marion Maxi from um, uh, Chicago, and she showed in, an, in a randomized clinical trial of Reposidil versus no Reposidil after DSO that there was an increased cell count and a decreased time to clearance. Natarsidil is available in the U.S. Uh, there's not a lot been published on that yet. There are some studies in progress. There is one case report uh, in the literature. Here's an example of one of my patients who had a five millimeter decimase strip. She cleared in three weeks and her six month cell count uh, was 1300. And she uh, has now had both eyes done and is doing very well. So there's not a lot in the literature uh, with rock inhibitors yet. You can see in those initial citations there that there's only a small handful that have been published, but many more have been presented. And I uh, have kept track of over 200 cases published or presented uh, at meetings. And shown uh, on the slides is another one of my DSO patients who was treated with Reposidil. And you can see the confocal where the, the edge of the desmetorexis is. So while anecdotal reports and small case series are nice, the way to, tr to show that something truly works is by generating level one evidence. And to that end, we are now currently uh, conducting uh, a, a multinational, multi-center phase two trial looking at uh, Reposidil uh, after, after decimate stripping. This is sponsor sponsored by COA. Uh, strict enrollment criteria, the patients will be enrolled after surgery if the DSO falls within the um, allotted limits. And our primary endpoint is endothelial cell count. At three months, we are exploring multiple endpoints. Um, obviously, the uh, COVID-19 crisis has uh, reduced our ability to get this trial up and running, but we do have several sites activated. So in conclusion, desmase stripping only has been shown to be successful in up to 100% of patients in certain series. The clearance time is generally three to six weeks. It appears like Reposidil and possibly Nitarsidil speeds up the process, turning non-responders into responders and increasing final cell counts. There are many remaining questions, as with any novel procedure, determining the optimal patient population, the best size and shape for the desmetorexis, and the amount and duration of postoperative steroids. Uh, we look uh, forward to the results of randomized clin clinical trials so we can actually generate level one evidence and, and get this approved for widespread use. I appreciate the opportunity to join here. Uh, I wish everyone uh, a, a safe and healthy end to the coronavirus pandemic. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Catherine, for that talk and for insights into uh, DSO. Now I would like to invite uh, Dr. Benny Jeng to give his talk on DSEC tips and tricks. Thank you very much, Namrata. Um, I'm putting my slide up right now. Thank you for inviting me and uh, 
Amar, thank you for inviting me as well. And congratulations on a very wildly successful OPL from a couple of days ago. Um, so I was asked to talk about some tips and tricks for DSEC. And even though this procedure has been around for you know, 15, 20 years, I think we all still have little nuances that we can learn to uh, help improve our patient outcomes. This in spite of the fact that you're gonna hear about DMEC being more and more popular, I still think that DSEC has a role um, and so we'll talk about 10 quick tips um, starting from the very beginning pre-op to through the end of surgery that might help us with our practice. So I have no relevant financial interests. So tip number one, pre-op is to check the surface. So we've all seen this. We all know that this is corneal edema. And if we do EK, the edema will go away and we'll have an excellent outcome like this. However, it is very important to look very carefully. This could look like edema from far away, but if you look carefully, you can see that this is actually scarring. And if Patients have waited long enough that they get subepithelial fibrosis and scarring. This patient had an EK, but ended up with best spectacle corrective visual acuity of only 2150 because of the scarring and irregular astigmatism. With a contact lens, she could see 2025, but that discussion has to happen before surgery. Number two, if you're gonna do EK, I would highly recommend doing either ultra thin or nano thin, so less than 100 microns in thickness of the graft. 15 years ago when I did DSEC, um, you can see here, this is 150 microns. We even use tissue up to 200 microns. And we know now that compared to the thicker grafts, in general, we accept the fact that thinner grafts tend to have better uh, corrective visual acuity, faster visual acuity, and definitely lower uh, graft rejection rates. And so there's definitely a benefit to doing uh, thinner tissue if you're going to choose to do uh, DSEC. Number three, don't strip the area by the wound unnecessarily. What do I mean by that? Um, there's a tendency that if you're stripping and you pull the, the tissue, you might just want to pull the tissue right by the wound and pull the whole graft in. Be very careful to actually strip that area right in front of the wound so that you don't pull all the tissue away. What do I mean by that? So magnified, this is the area where you don't wanna unnecessarily strip that tissue in front of the uh, posterior uh, lip of the wound and where you should be stripping. You, you wanna preserve as much of the tissue as possible. For uh, DMEC is a little bit different. You oversize, oversize the stripping, but for DSEC, don't strip unnecessarily. Number four, rough up the periphery. So um, I don't advocate being too aggressive, but um, I think a little bit of roughing up, um, even with a Sinsky hook just at the very periphery here actually does help with the adhesion. I really do think it works. On the flip side, what we used to do, which was venting incisions regularly, I don't advocate doing these regularly. Why, why do I not? I think that the, the benefit of it has not been shown to be that great. Um, studies have shown that if you uh, wait long enough or have enough pressurization, then any interface fluid will go away. But there are probably some roles where if you really can't get the interface fluid to go away, that maybe you could do this. The, the downside of doing this regularly is that epithelial ingrowth is definitely a problem. And I have had several cases in the past of irregular stigmatism from these um, incisions. So I'd, I'd recommend not doing these on a regular basis. Number six, trim the tube. Okay, we know that if there's a tube there, most likely it is the cause of why we're doing EK surgery. But if we're not going to actually put that tube into the pars plana in behind the iris, then at least get it out of the way. Um, because that tube, the longer it is, the more trauma it's gonna cause to the cornea, no matter how well-placed your glaucoma colleague thinks that it is. Number seven, know how to do one technique really, really well. So the technique that I usually go to for this, 90% um, of the time is with the endosurter. Um, I think that at this point, uh, you know, all different studies will say that the results are probably equivocal. Um, so pick a technique, do it well, learn all the nuances of how to get it done successfully. Um, and in general, your, your outcomes will be very, very good. The corollary to that is know how to do other techniques as well, okay? Just knowing one technique is not usually good enough. Um, Dr. Tu is going to go over his suture pull-through technique, which I learned from him, but this is great for AFAKES. Um, Dr. Barry Lee uh, does this very elegant, very quick um, sheath glide technique. Um, there are other pull-through techniques, either with the uh, endo glide or uh, the uh, Boussine uh, glide. And then, of course, if they don't send what you need and you have to do uh, folding, you really ought to know how to fold um, and get the uh, graft in. You could even do it with your forceps if you have to. And so it's important not only to know how to do one technique well, but you should also need to know how to do other techniques to get you out of jams. Number nine, 
during the time, whether it's five minutes or 10 minutes or 12 minutes that you're gonna wait for the eye to pressurize before you do the uh, air fluid exchange, um, if the graft moves at all, give strong consideration to suturing it. Why? Because if it's gonna move under those controlled circumstances, it will likely move postoperatively when the patient's not in your sight. And so you can have something like this where the graft is detached and settled inferiorly, or it might be attached, but it might have moved and slid either inferiorly or superiorly. So if it moves while you're watching it, you ought to suture it. And number 10, if you're going to suture it and use a retention suture, place it inferiorly. Um, why do I say that? Because it, the default is that the air bubble is going to go superiorly because the patient's always going to be slightly inclined. So why not have some uh, securing inferiorly with the suture if you're going to do it, and then the air bubble will help retain it up at the top. And this generally ends up with a very, very good outcome. You can still rebubble at the slit length if you need to, but an inferior suture is what I would recommend. So in conclusion, um, you know, there are a lot of nuances to doing DSEC and people have gotten very, very good at it. But if you can keep in a couple of pearls to help, um, your patients will do very, very well. Thank you for your attention and good luck. Thank you very much, Benny. It's such a pleasure to have you with us here. I thought we'll just ask uh, Catherine one question is, uh, do you suggest that people be ready with the patients? Suppose it fails so that they can go in for an endothelial keratoplasty rather than just sticking to a DSO? Uh, yeah, I always counsel patients that they may need to have an endothelial keratoplasty. Generally, we make the decision um, anywhere from six to 12 weeks. Sometimes people are slow to heal, uh, but if they stop healing or if they get frustrated, or you've reached the three month point and they're not healed, you should just uh, proceed to your EK of choice. And what about you, Terry? Are you using DSEC? What thickness are you using, Terry? Uh, primarily, really, DMEC um, uh, and DSEC for complex cases. Um, and I've found that to be a pretty uh, good approach. I've only tried DSO in one case that was kind of like an endothelial scar from uh, an inadvertent touching of the cornea that was referred in. And uh, you made it look very elegant, Kathy, when you were stripping decimates, but sometimes it's, it's a little piecemeal, doesn't come out nicely, maybe in that particular scenario. And I was, I was curious for you, does the edge uh, um, congruity make a difference in terms of visual acuity quality? Because in my patient, the edges are a little irregular, and I find that if this patient is still having some glare. Uh, are there some, you know, tips for that in terms of helping patients that may still have, um, you know, visual aberrations? So I think I think uh, you want to make sure it's centered on the visual axis as much as possible. Um, you want to avoid try digging into the stroma. I, for years, I did this with a reverse Simsky hook and patients were happy, but I would make very small, um, small kind of maneuvers in the eye. I wouldn't like do a big, a big scrape and really make it more like, um, you know, those of us who are old enough will rem remember when we did um, anterior capsulotomies for cataract surgery. And it's that same kind of maneuver only upside down but really try to make as smooth of an edge as possible and not, um, not leave tags and center it. But I agree, they don't all come off that nicely. That's why I show that one. Dr. Dr. Rajesh Pogla, your take on DSO? Rajesh Pogla? Well, uh, we don't see patients in the early stage as what they see in the US. By the time patients come to us with decreased vision, the, the extent of gutte are much wider. And I think Samar Basak has had uh, some experience with DSO. And in fact, one of the last presentations that he made, he found recurrence of Kate at two-year follow-up within the area where he had done the decimal stripping only. So what for the time being... This? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Rajesh. Yeah, so I think it is about selection of cases uh, okay. rather than... And you're right here, we don't see that very early cases or probably don't pick them up. And our... Uh, severe cases are so severe that, you know, you land up just doing uh, uh, endothelial keratoplasty for those cases. Liz, what about you? Are you doing DSEC? What thickness are you using? Anything you can tell us? Sure. I, I certainly agree. Um, Benny, beautiful presentation with regards to the thickness of the DSEC. For myself, I prefer 60 microns, which is kind of on the higher edge of a nano thin, on the lower edge of the ultra thin. When you get a little bit thinner than that, it does 
tend to scroll a little more like a DMAC and it kind of poses a little bit of a challenge there. I do prefer a pull through technique using my Boozin, but I could not agree more that it's so important that we do know how to utilize different techniques. And DSEC is my preferential technique to go to instead of DMEC if I'm going to do a triple with a cataract surgery because it's a lot easier to maintain a nice deep chamber than to have a super shallow chamber doing cataract surgery. And truly visual outcomes, while it may take two to three weeks longer, they really do come out really well. And then ultimately with my wounds, I always make them a little bit shorter, as Benny mentioned, because you want to... Uh, make sure that there's no crossover between the inner lip of any of your wounds and uh, and where your DSEC will overlie because that certainly can leave a certain level of vulnerability for uh, potential uh, non-attachment. Oh, there's one more question about uh, Ripasudel because uh, rock inhibitor, like uh, uh, you suggested that we could use it post-operatively, but the one, the counterpart that we have in India causes congestion. So I don't know if you all have experience the same in U.S.? Uh, you mean it uh, uh, it causes conjunctival hyperemia? Yes, is yes. That, yeah, yeah, it does. I would say maybe 10% of patients have it. Um, it, it. You're not using it chronically like you are for glaucoma, so patients can usually manage the redness for, for the time that they're on it. Kathy, beyond the redness, is the comfort level of that drop good? Because I know yeah. there is some discomfort, you know, that can be associated with rock inhibitors. I don't know if my patients are just so eager to to get better that they they're not telling me, but no one complains about about it being uncomfortable to use. Kathy, how long do you treat them with uh, with your? Um, so I treat well, and again, let's let's say this the right way. I don't treat them because it's not FDA approved. They right. get the drug, and I monitor them while they're using it, and. Uh, they they use it until the cornea is clear four times a day, and then it's a pretty rapid taper over a week or two, depending on how much of the drop they have left. We're about to publish an AJO or a series of patients who have this reticular epithelial cell edema. Um, some of it may be associated with the uh, nutarsidal that we're using. And so we're finding that we're using it only for a certain time period, like two weeks, and then we stop it. Um, and so we're just still trying to learn the best time to use it, when to use it, how long to use it, uh, at least with nutarsidol, which is FDA approved here. Yeah, the, the honeycomb edema is known. Not every patient gets it, and I think it's slightly less common when you're using it four times a day. I haven't used nutarsidol for uh, after DSO, but mm. um, yeah, it's well known, but it resolves. Susan, you had a question? Uh, yeah, Kathy, I wanted to know, uh, is there an upper or lower specular count that you look at preoperatively? And also, do you look at the peripheral specular count as well, or is it just the central one that you look at? Well, so most of these people, you can't detect any cells by specular. So I use confocal, and I look at um, generally the superior cornea because I figure that's going to be the best cell count because it's been protected by the eyelid and doesn't have as much UV exposure. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it is important to do some sort of analysis of the peripheral endothelium. You want to make sure that the cells look relatively healthy and that there's enough of them to repopulate. Uh, but you can, you know, you actually can do that with a clinical exam on high, on high mag um, uh, with your slit lamp. Thank you very much, Catherine. Namrata? Yes, next. so I think we move on to the next talk with this, uh, and the next talk is going to be given by Dr. Barry Lee, DSEC in difficult situations. Okay, everybody see that? Perfect. Okay, so I don't have any financial disclosures for this talk. So I think the big question is, DSEC still relevant? We've already talked about that already this morning. Um, you know, we think everyone's doing DMEC and PDEC, right? So if you look at the statistics, it's really not uh, not so true. Uh, from 2010, we've seen a big shift in our EBA statistics. This is all the eye banks in the U.S. that are reported. And you can see still 60% of the endothelial keratoplasties, at least in the U.S. data, is still DSEC. So it's still the more common procedure performed, uh, as you can see here on the breakdown. So 60% of the EKs in 2019 were we're actually DSEC. 
And I think it's, uh, Terry mentioned this earlier, it's the complex situations where I think DMEC or PDEC might be a little bit challenging. And that's kind of where I'll go to doing a DSEC. Uh, we, I do probably 75% of the cases now with DMEC and 20% are with DSEC, but it's these complex situations where I think the DSEC tends to work better. So we've got glaucoma, cornea, severe corneal edema, and a cloudy cornea, aphakia. We have a talk on aphakia coming up, so we won't do too much on that. Uh, anterior chamber IOLs or dislocated IOLs. Uh, Amar's shown a lot of videos in ASH as well where they've done PDEX uh, along with dislocated IOLs, and that could be a pretty challenging situation where I think um, a DSEC could be helpful. And then uh, I'm going to show a video of a shallow anterior chamber and a very short eye, almost a nanophthalmic eye with a lot of posterior pressure and just show a video of doing a DSEC on that case. So you, obviously the tube shunts, you saw a video earlier where that's been trimmed, can be particularly challenging. Here's one of my patients. Uh, it's thought that DSECs with tube shunts don't last long. This is a patient I just saw last month. I did this in 2006. And this picture was from last month. The DSEC is still clear. You can see a tube shunt at uh, one o'clock and another tube shunt at about five o'clock. So uh, they can last for a long time in, in some rare situations. Uh, here's a patient with an anterior chamber IOL and a Zen stent. And you can see here how the DSEC is uh, very nicely clear over those the shunt and the AC IOL. Uh, and obviously the problem with a, with a trabeculectomy or a bleb is that the air, as you can see, your air has gone into the bleb as I'm trying to inject it intraoperatively. So that can be a challenge as that air really sucks out of the anterior chamber. Cloudy corneas are a particular challenge for DMEC procedures. Uh, this is a discoform edematous patient. It's now got a lot of scarring. So as Benny mentioned, if you're going to do a DSEC on this patient, you really need to think about uh, it, can you reduce the scarring with steroids and uh, will you need a gas perm contact lens afterwards. But this, you can see how a DMEC on this case would be really challenging. This is an intraoperative patient where I've actually removed the epithelium because it was so cloudy. And you can still see the view is pretty poor. This is a dark iris. It's tough to see the staining on DMEC tissue sometimes in a dark iris, especially when the uh, cornea is very edematous. I think the thickness here was almost 900 microns. So this would be a particularly challenging one for a DMEC procedure. Here's a decentered and failed DSEC graft. And you can see just uh, this was over 1,000 microns on pachymetry. That would be really challenging to strip this and be able to see to do a DMEC. And then another patient here with... Uh, severe pseudophagic corneal edema and glaucoma, again, where the pachymetry was over a thousand microns. So those are cases where the, the staining, the vital dye staining with a, with a DMEC procedure would be pretty challenging. Um, hopefully the Americans are watching Ash and Amar and Susan so we can learn more about PDEC because you saw the PDEC numbers on my statistics were pretty low. Uh, here's an aphakic patient presented after an airbag injury. So it caused corneal edema and uh, dislocated cataract in the back of the eye. Here's another patient referred to me for aphakia that had severe corneal edema. Uh, the retinal surgeon here had done a parse plane of vitrectomy and lensectomy and then sent to me. And, and this was before the custom flex iris implant. So I used a blue optech implant and then did a DSEC on top of that at the same time. So uh, gave a nice cosmetic result and resolved the corneal edema from the injury. And then we have anterior chamber IOLs. Uh, this is certainly controversial. I think if you see as this anterior chamber lens is really well placed, it's nicely, the haptics are nicely in the anterior chamber. The anterior chamber depth in this patient is about four millimeters, so it's a good AC depth. So this is a, a cornea where if it decompensated, I wouldn't be too concerned about exchanging the IOL. I might just go ahead and do a DSEC. But certainly if the anterior chamber is very shallow, or the anterior chamber IOL is, is poorly placed, uh, you'd probably want to think about doing an IOL exchange, doing a glued IOL or Yamani technique to fixate a IOL to the sclera and then do your DSEC on top of that. Again, those are cases that might be tough for a, for a DMEC. So just kind of review this case. This is a patient with a 69-year-old female, very hyperopic, a plus nine. She'd already had a corneal transplant in the left eye and had a high amount of astigmatism. Didn't really like to wear a contact lens. You can see she saw fairly well when she wore the contact, but the right eye had deteriorated significantly to 2080 on Snell and Acuity. She had fairly advanced fixed dystrophy and then both eyes had cataracts. But the axial length was 19 millimeters and the anterior chamber depth was 1.9 millimeters. So really uh, kind of a challenging case uh, to do, and I was planning on doing a DSEC FACO. 
Uh, just to short, start the video here, I like to make the incision initially uh, to 2.8 millimeter corneal incision. You can see the viscoelastic immediately burped out of the eye as soon as I injected. That was uh, Helon. And you're going to see here as I go in with a uh, Yatrata, the eye is already starting to crimp up in between my Yatrata forceps. And so I'm having to be really careful here because if I go too fast, I'm going to strip the iris. You see how the iris is coming through the forceps again, and now it's starting to prolapse. Um, so just really having a hard time managing the anterior chamber. So I'm going to come out here. I'm going to put in a Helon GV, which is a little bit thicker, cohesive viscoelastic, uh, to push the iris back in. Finish my capsule rexus. And again, just trying to keep the chamber formed. You can see the iris is starting to prolapse again. So this is a little trick on these cases I like to do. And you, this is helpful for phacos too, is make a little stab incision behind the incision. And I'm just going to take an iris hook. You have to be really careful here, right? And I first initially almost got the anterior capsule edge and don't want to do that because it'll rip. Uh, I'm going to catch it again here with the hook. Let's see if I can speed that up for time's sake. And here what I did is I actually put a little bit more viscoelastic in between the iris and the anterior capsule, and that's going to give me a little bit more space to work with. And now the hook goes right in, tie that in. And so now you don't have to worry about the iris prolapse for this, uh, for this entire case. So I'm going to go ahead and just skip the FACO part of this. Uh, I ended up putting in a hydrophobic acrylic IOL. If I can speed that up for time's sake. Um, stripping the endothelium. Now, when I do a DSEC FACO, I don't mark the cornea because the iris is a great marker for you. So it's sort of a wasted step for me. So I'm just going to follow the pupil edge here, and it makes for an excellent mark without having to use any pens or marking agents. Uh, and again, here using a Sensky hook to strip it out and then pulling out the, the tissue. You can still see the iris is behaving great uh, with that iris hook, even though the AC depth is just really shallow here. Uh, we're going to take that out. Now I'm going to remove the hook. This is a step where you want to get rid of it, and then you'll do your viscoelastic. And at this point, I'm going to enlarge the incision. I think I edited this out, but I'm going to enlarge the incision for 2.8 to about 4.5 millimeters. And then I'm going to put a sheet slide down. I think Benny showed this technique earlier. Uh, I like to do this on all my DSET cases. I don't really find that I need any other techniques. Um, so we're going to fill up the anterior chamber. I'm going to really coat the sheets glide vigorously with viscoelastic. And you'll see I use a lot of viscoelastic here so that that glide is completely covered. And then I'm going to take the desec tissue. The eye bank has already pre-cut it. This is probably about, this is like Liz says, like about 60 to 80 microns. We're going to grab the lip of the wound and then take a 30 gauge needle. Um, and you'll see on this really shallow anterior chamber eye, this really works pretty easily. Um, it does try to come out here a little bit as I'm coming back, so I'm going to push the tissue here a little slower. And then I'm going to fill the anterior chamber up with a little bit of BSS, try to give it a little bit of shape. Um, and then I usually will put in two interrupted sutures. These are 10 nylon sutures, and then do your DSEC air bubble. So. You can see how that little trick with the iris hook really helped make this case manageable. Uh, that would have been impossible to do with forceps delivery. It would have been challenging to do with having to come across the anterior chamber with a, um, with a boost and glide. And so the sheet slide technique really helped me on that situation. Uh, so just in summary, uh, you know, obviously I showed the statistics. DSEX is still relevant, at least in the iBank statistics here in the U.S. We're about 60% now doing more DSEC than, than DMEC or PDEC. And I think challenging situations are really the cases where DSEC can be helpful, uh, where DMEC might be a little bit more challenging, uh, aphakia, a large iridectomy, cloudy corneas, and certainly IOL problems. But I, you know, I think Benny mentioned it earlier, just you know, multiple, knowing multiple techniques and then trying to figure out what the best technique is for you is really the way to be more successful and to deal with some of these challenging cases. And certainly having DMEC and PDEC in your in your toolbox is also going to be helpful for some of these other cases. Uh, so thanks for your time. I appreciate Amar, Susan, I appreciate the opportunity to, to uh, speak today. It's a great Thank you session. very much, Barry. Thanks so much, Barry. Namrata. Thank you. Uh...
Dr. Barry Lee for that uh, very nice uh, presentation on challenging cases. And now the next speaker is Dr. Elmer Tu. Oh no, just kidding. Who is going to be speak on, speaking on suture pull through DSEC. Dr. Elmer Tu is very well known to us because he's taken numerous courses on DSEC at our center, RP Center, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, as well as all over India. So we are thankful to him for having taught us DSEC. Yes, Elmer. Elmer, you need to unmute. Yeah, unmute. Okay. No, I'm sorry. Me. I'm off now. Uh, anyway, I, I'm not sure that I taught anyone anything there, but <laughs> the, the surgeons are excellent uh, in India, and, and we've learned a lot also from from uh, our interactions. So I very much appreciate the opportunity to present. Uh, as part of this conference. And uh, thank you, Amara. Thank you, Dr. Nimrata, for all the uh, support that you've shown us over the years. Um, sort of in the vein of what uh, Barry and, uh, and Benny have talked about is that DSEC still has some relevance, I think, um, in, in our world. I, in some of these more difficult eyes, I, I think that it's still a very good technique. And it also has something to do with the patient compliance. I'm going to present uh, something that I um, started doing many, many years ago, which is a uh, suture pull-through technique for DSEC. Uh, the first parts of the procedure are standard then with a desmetorexis. This is a very quick video just showing you with the synopsis. This is one of the original procedures that we had done with a straight needle. And you can see the imbrication of the tissue. Um, and then the wound is created here. Uh, there is an anterior chamber maintainer uh, that is basically on surgeon control, so you can control the anterior chamber as you like uh, during the procedure. You may not use it at all, or you may need it in certain aspects or certain uh, points during the procedure. So after removing decimase, the tissue has been pre-prepared by you uh, in imbricating it. Um, it's a double arm suture. You can. This is a horizontal approach where <clears throat> you're basically taking one needle across and then you follow, follow it with the second. <clears throat> excuse me, and then you basically just grab the suture and through the incision you bring the suture into the anterior chamber. You can see the graft centers very nicely. Um, once you close this and the anterior chamber starts to deepen, often the tissue itself will open spontaneously, uh, but otherwise manipulation is fairly easy. You can use a, a needle if you want to move the tissue over. This is a situation where we had removed the suture um, and centered the tissue with the needle here. Uh, with a final air fill. Just to uh, focus in a little bit on some of the parts of the procedure that are a little bit different than a standard DSEC. Um, and here is the preparation of the donor tissue. Uh, you cut the posterior lenticule as you normally do to your desired size. Um, you want to place just a very small amount of viscoelastic uh, in the interface or on the endothelial side. The needles that we use now are the CTC6 needle, which is an Ethicon needle, it's bent, and you're going straight through um, from, and from both sides of stroma, and then the needle is actually buried into the cap so that the needle head comes out and is easy to grasp on the other side. Here, you can see the entire preparation of the donor tissue does not involve touching or squeezing the tissue in any way, and this is just placed aside, and then you can go ahead and um, uh, start preparing uh, the, the recipient. And the graphical appearance of the tissue at the end is shown on the bottom right. Insertion uh, of an anterior chamber maintainer is important. Uh, this was a combined procedure, so we actually did it after the cataract surgery, which makes it a little more challenging because it's um, uh, the chamber is fairly soft. Um, but the one thing you want to do is to make sure the anterior chamber maintainer is directed away from where your graft is and isn't involved in where the graft will eventually sit. Um, again, this is usually on foot pedal control um, and uh, is only used when the chamber uh, seems to be unstable when you're passing uh, those sutures that I just showed you. Just a brief word about the corneal incision size. Uh, usually you can use a keratoma of basically any size, but the wound we normally would be about half a millimeter larger than half of the diameter of the folded tissue. So if it's an eight millimeter graft folded 50-50, I usually make the, the uh, wound size about 4 to 4.5. Um, it can go through a smaller one, but 
uh, the tissue does get squeezed, I think, as it goes through and it may get distorted and you may have some endothelial damage. So it's always better to go a little bit larger than smaller um, than you need to. Uh, and one distinction from uh, what was talked about earlier, I actually make my corneal wound longer and have the internal portion of the wound within the area where the DSEC will sit. And the reason for that is that when the DSEC is opened, it will actually tamponade the internal opening of the wound. And see, these patients actually have very stable wounds. They're easy, easy to suture. Once the, once the graft is open, the air stays and will not come through the main wound, even if there's some slight gap there. So I have a tendency to make the corneal entry wound longer um, rather than shorter uh, to actually be involved in the area where the DSEC will be. The key here to passing the suture is really two. One is to make sure that you have the correct suture on the correct side because there's a right suture and a left suture. So when you open up the tissue, you wanna make sure that they're not crossed. The second part is what you're gonna visualize here in the video is that once you're in the wound, you wanna sweep that needle right and left to make sure you haven't caught any fibers of stroma as you've gone across. The most disappointing thing is that when you go in, not realizing it, and then realize that your graft won't go in because you have some suture or some stroma actually in the suture itself. So that's a very important step is to go into the wound and make sure you sweep across to make sure there aren't any fibers of stroma that your needle have caught as it's gone across the anterior chamber. These needles, as you bring them across, it's better to be further than closer. Uh, you'd rather not have the needles come out early, uh, but you can very precisely place where this graft is going to be. And this is especially helpful in patients who have had a graft failure, for example, from a PKP. Uh, you can very precisely put the transplant exactly where you want it. You can see the sweeping motion, you bring across the needle. This is from a superior approach, um, and you come right through the cornea on the other side. Um, once that's through, uh, you will see that uh, you can just bring the suture across, and once that's taken through, you'll have a double arm suture attached to your graft, and then you can just pull on the sutures. People will often take some time trying to even up the length of the sutures. It's really not necessary. It's, ver it's very self-regulating, so that if you pull both of the sutures on the other end, uh, any excess suture on the right or left-hand side will, will equalize without any difficulty. So you can see here, you just grasp the suture there and you can bring the suture or the tissue onto the field. You can see graphically it's being shown down below what happens, but you basically have the tissue right into the wound edge. And then once, you, once it's tucked in, you can just bring it into the anterior chamber and you can see very nicely that the graft is centered fairly, uh, uh, fairly well within the marks that you had done your capsule orexis. One of the things is that when you bring this tissue across, occasionally there may be a little bit of tissue uh, still in the wound. All you need to do is tap on, the, on that wound and that should bring uh, the posterior part of that in. Most of these sutures will require just a single suture. Um, being around four millimeters, you really don't need much more than that. Uh, I have actually done these sutureless occasionally. Um, again, because the interior internal part of the wound is um, tamponaded by the open DSEC uh, tissue, uh, but I really haven't found that to be that helpful in terms of astigmatism or anything else. So once you do this, uh, you'll find that you've already, you probably noticed from the video that the, wound, the uh, graft is already spontaneously open. So once the chamber is deep, you have the tissue being uh, brought up to the posterior surface of the stroma by the original proline suture, and so the graft has room to open underneath. Um, so it actually works very well and, and uh, requires very minimal manipulation. After you're finished with um, suturing the wound, you'll tie off the proline. Uh, that can be left in place. And with a superior approach, as Benny was recommending earlier, if you feel that there's a concern about graft dislocation, you'll have a pre-placed um, uh, stay suture there for your graft, uh, which causes very minimal striae, um, as opposed to having to put it in later. Normally, I'll tie this proline very loosely so it doesn't cause any striae, and the knot is left out, and usually we can remove that the following day, as long as the graft is well-centered and attached. I've left it in for several weeks in certain patients with glaucoma procedures and that where we're unable to keep the chamber deep and pressurized. So it is well tolerated, even for that length of time. You can put a bandage contact lens over it if you want. 
to help with discomfort. So in summary, um, this, ha is, this technique allows a very atraumatic graft manipulation. Uh, over on the right, you'll see the video showing the uh, DSEC done in a patient with an abnormal pupil and aphakia. Um, one of the advantages is that stay suture will prevent the graft from entering the posterior chamber at any time. Um, and so that, that's uh, certainly helpful in aphakic patients, but this also is, can be helpful in ACIOLs. Patients, as I mentioned, who are hypotenuse from glaucoma surgery or have other unusual anterior segment anatomy. Uh, for the beginning DSEC surgeon, this is excellent because there's no chance of graft rejection, or I'm sorry, graft ejection um, with the anterior chamber maintainer in place. The suture will prevent that graft from ending up on your lap. Uh, really, this uh, involves the smallest incision possible really for any folded graft that you can put into the anterior chamber. And it's really a, a largely a single-handed technique um, other than holding the graft. The other nice thing about this is it's a very inexpensive disposable delivery system. It's probably something you have in the operating room right now if you do any type of IOL manipulations. Uh, we use these Ethicon needles, but there are analogous sutures that are available everywhere else. Really any long needles, whether it be straight or, or, or curved, can be used for this particular purpose. On the bottom is a, an aphakic, completely flat anterior chamber DSEC that we had done probably over 12 years ago, which is still clear now in a one-eyed individual who has rubella. So thank you again for your um, invitation to speak today. I hope uh, this will be somewhat helpful um, and I wish you all the best of luck. Thank you, Dr. Almer, for that wonderful presentation. And I think this technique is very useful for, in fact, like you said, all kinds of cases and very predictable. And now it is my pleasure to invite the next speaker, Dr. Sophie Dang. Uh, she's going to be speaking about DMAC tips and tricks. So we have to unmute. Yes. Uh, yeah. Can you see my screen? Yes, Sophie, we are, you're on. Great. Um, first of all, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to share my experience on uh, DMAC, especially um, uh, tri uh, tricks and tips in difficult cases. And the go-to technique I use uh, is called touch but no touch technique when I do the DMAC. Um, and I will use the uh, ICL injector um, I fold the uh, graph and double scroll facing a position and inject it into the anterior chamber. And to be careful when you uh, withdraw the injector, make sure the graph doesn't um, eject it out, as what Elmer mentioned. Um, the go to technique that I use is this uh, single cannula technique. Uh, this double scroll facing a position, so the cannula inserted into the interface. Uh, using a tucking motion, and this is real time. Um, you can see the slowly tucking it, and the grab will unfold quite easily. So this is the way that I unfold my tissue. So the tips uh, on DMAC, I think it's all about control, controlling every step of the procedure, uh, always think ahead and prepare for the next step. For example, I show you that um, Fold the graph in double scroll uh, facing a position before um, you load it into the uh, injector. So once the graph in uh, inside the eye, uh, the graph is already half unfold. So half the work has been done. The second tip, uh, I think, is the most important tip for a successful DMAP is controlling the anterior chamber depth, and this is critical. I'm going to show you two um, ways to um, control or create uh, the depth or shallow the anterior chamber depth. The other one, uh, one critical uh, success for a long-term survival of the graph is to control the movement of the graph in the anterior chamber. Um, I do not like flipping uh, the graph. I do not like any upside down graft. So I show you uh, the technique that um, very uh, controlling, in a very controlling fashion, the graph is inside the AC, but um, there is little movement when um, the graph is being unfolded. Again, what Benny said uh, earlier is I learned multiple techniques and sometimes in some conditions uh, that uh, different techniques will be very useful, like tapping technique uh, that is very uh, helpful in certain uh, situations. 
So the trick uh, number one is how to uh, keep the anterior chamber shallow. And those, uh, these techniques are really uh, important uh, in eyes uh, have gone, uh, undergone a uh, vitrectomy, uh, eyes with pseudo exfoliation, and also the eyes have undergone a suture IOL, either iris sutured or, or uh, scleral fixated IOL. And this is a um, post vitrectomized eye, and you can see the AC is pretty shallow. And I was using my uh, go to technique, uh, use single canal technique to unfold it, which is easily. But then the AC is so deep that I had to uh, withdraw some AC uh, fluid, but still. Uh, once my camera came out from the eye, the graph become uh, folded in again. So it's a battle between um, the graph and you sometimes uh, doing, uh, when you do this uh, complex uh, surgery. So normally if I have a um, assistant, I will have uh, the per person use a curved tie, uh, push down on the cornea. Uh, that would create a shallow um, anterior chamber and I unfold the tissue, and then I will go under the uh, graph to unfold it. Sometimes that uh, there's some uh, folds still remaining on, on the periphery, the gentle tapping technique like that, and, and you can unfold the entire graft. So uh, then uh, continue to fill the uh, AC with uh, air. So this is the technique that I normally use to uh, control the anterior chamber depth. Um, if there's no uh, assistance, uh, then I have done is to one hand holding uh, the curved tie, another hand to unfold the tissue and um, and then uh, inject the air. This is doable, but uh, a little bit challenging. So the other uh, case I want to share with you is that uh, often we see this uh, pretty complex and uh, eyes with complex anterior chamber. For example, this patient has um, gone through a shunt procedure and a trap procedure in the past, uh, and other among others, um, needling of the blab and uh, and. Uh, He's also sort of fake as well. So when she presented to me, she had only a um, very small window of uh, anterior chamber. The rest of the iris stuck to the cornea, uh, and but she it did have a very uh, stable IOL. So um, during the surgery, uh, at this stage, I already removed epithelium, so I was able to see the contour of the iris. So the, so the visualization is uh, a little bit challenging in this case. And uh, to create an anterior chamber in such complex eyes, uh, I uh, first use a, a 30 gauge cannula to dissect, uh, I mean, follow the plane and then remove this um, uh, very tight adhesion. Uh, because we're doing a DMAT for this case, so we don't really uh, too much care about the uh, uh, and the cilium with anything left, um, when the adhesion is really tight, the intraocular uh, scissors uh, often is necessary to uh, cut this adhesion without um, damaging the iris uh, too much when uh, you put it. So the, there's a quite thick of the uh, retrocornea cornea membrane in this eye. Um, and sometimes they do bleed as in this eye. And um, this eye is one of the eyes that bled most. And eventually the entire eye feel is blood, a bohyphema, but a big patient. So we use a intraocular epinephrine to stop the bleeding and then followed by anterior uh, retractomy to uh, remove the clot. Eventually the anterior chamber is formed and the bleeding stopped. Then I use the same technique, uh, the graft injected in, uh, through the um, using the ICL injector. Uh, the visualization is a little poor, but uh, because the blue cannula technique, you, uh, you know the, the orientation of the graph, uh, and that graph can be um, uh, unfolded successfully. And this patient, amazingly, she was able to see 2020, three months out, and now I think four years, five years out now, she is still 2030, 2040. So in such a complex eyes, it's feasible to do uh, DMAC, but uh, the key thing is to control the anterior chamber and control the movement of this uh, graft inside the eye. Um, as uh, Benny and Elmo mentioned, that uh, in the eye 
device with shunts. Uh, the shunts right there and often you need to trim it and also avoid excessive movement of the graph inside the eye so that they will not uh, have a excessive uh, endothelial cell loss. So the key, I think, to do uh, DMA in such complex eyes is control. I mean, full, full control of every step of the procedure. And number one key is take control of the anterior chamber depth so that the unfolding uh, is feasible. And again, thank you so much for uh, your attention. And thank you for allowing me to share uh, some of our surgeries with you. Thank you. Thank you, Sophie. I think uh, those cases were really complex for DMEC, especially the last one with uh, high femur inside, but uh, managed very well. So now I invite uh, Dr. Rajesh Sena to give his talk on endothelial keratoplasty in AFA care. Uh, thank you, Dr. Namrata and uh, Dr. Amar for having me here in this, uh, this webinar. Talking about endothelial keratoplasty in AFA care. Uh, endothelial keratoplasty has evolved over time. Now it started with DLEC and then DSEC and then DMEC. We had ultra thin DSEC in between. Then we had uh, we have PDEC now. So over the period, we have understood that it's thinner the better. That's less the stroma in the donor lenticule. You have faster visual rehabilitation. However, there are certain cases wherein you have certain issues, like in aphakia, you have issues related, one, to refractive correction because you don't have an IOL, risk of suboptimal tamponade because of uh, lack of uh, support of IOL, and then uh, there can be, there is risk of uh, lenticular displacement, and sometimes, as you could see in earlier presentation by Sophie, that you have to do anterior segment reconstruction. And in such a case, you can have high femur, you can have AC reaction. And in such a case, uh, although uh, DMEC or PDEC can be done as Sophie has shown and Dr. Amar will be showing, but in most of the hands, a safer bet will be an ultra thin DSEC, which is a good compromise between the ease of procedure and having a good outcome after the procedure. And various modifications have been described in FAK eyes. One, uh, Dr. Almer was showing that uh, use of suture to retain the DSEC lenticule, uh, and various other techniques have been used. One thing that everybody feels is that if you can place an IOL in its position, it will act as a scaffold to uh, provide a good air tamponade. And uh, uh, we can put an ACIOL as shown by Dr. Barry. Uh, if the anterior segment is, uh, is good, the iris is nice and with a round small pupil and a deep anterior chamber. However, in majority of these cases, you have, uh, these cases are quite complicated. And then in such a case, uh, if there is no capsule at all, then in that case, you have to do a clear fixation of IOL. Now the uh, suture transclear fixated IOLs have been used for the last so many years and uh, the uh, intrascleral haptic fixated IOL have come up now in the last decade. And uh, so uh, we, the IOL which remains stable by any technique will provide a good tamponade and that's why we performed an, uh, a UBM study to look for the stability of the IOL. And uh, this is a sutured IOL, transcleral sutured IOL, in which with the movement of eyeball, we could see that the lens is moving quite a lot and causing, uh, you know, it's touching the iris, causing pigment release, et cetera. However, in a glued IOL, or intrascleral haptic fixated IOL, you can see the IOL is quite steady. There's hardly any movement. So a more stable IOL is the one which is intrascleral haptic fixated one. And that is why we prefer ultra thin DSEC with intrascleral haptic fixated IOL. We published this article uh, a few years back. And uh, this is the basic uh, method that we imply and that we use. Uh, and uh, this is a micro with, the, with which you remove the interior lamella and then the posterior disc is created with the help of Trefine. And then uh, you mark this clearite 1.5 and 3 millimeter positions, and then you create to uh, create a lamellar dissection, create a flap and a groove adjacent to it, and then uh, remove the epithelium to improve visualization, do the scoring, and then you 
replace the uh, posterior chamber multi-piece eye well. This is the lens fixing process which is used to exteriorize one haptic and then the second haptic also being exteriorized and it is stuck into the groove made just into the flap and then fibrin glue is used to stick the flap into its position. And once this is done, you place the donor lenticule, uh, you introduce it into anterior chamber with the help of a recent glide and then put air for tamponade. Now, uh, in certain cases, you have a bad iris, and uh, in the course of time, I will skip the video, but uh, if you do iris reconstruction, and uh, a technique of single pass pore through introduced by the farmer is a very good technique to have a very good outcome, a good tamponade, and a good outcome uh, after the procedure. Now, all these procedures can be done as a single stage, or you can uh, make it a two-stage procedure. The reason why we felt that we should do a study to uh, see the results comparing these two stages is that if you do it all together, they, it may jeopardize the success of the graph. And that was one reason why uh, we, uh, in one uh, group, uh, we did all the steps together. In the other group, we did the still fixation of IOL, did iris reconstruction, sanicolysis, and as a second stage, we did DSEC. We found out that both are good, However, there's procedural ease in two stage, particularly in eyes with Sanike and vitreous in anterior chamber. Rebubbling was required more in single stage. Graph survival was better in sequential. And uh, we do use venting. This is one indication, only one indication wherein I put venting in session because most of these eyes are hypotenuse and the tamponade is not very effective. And in some of these cases, what I have found out that in spite of all these, uh, because of the uh, iris uh, configuration, because of the uh, hypotony, if you inject air in the anterior chamber, there's risk of air getting migrated into uh, posteriorly behind the iris and behind the lens. So uh, in such scenario, uh, I've just devised a very simple technique. What I use, I use a 30 gauge needle and I inject 0.5 to 1 ml of fluid through the pars plana into anterior, which is cavity. And as the pressure of the globe increases, it pushes the air, which migrates back to, into the anterior chamber and provides a good tamponade. And so far, I have done it in eight eyes and have found that in none of the eyes, uh, a rebubbling was required. So uh, in conclusion, ultra-thin BSEC is a challenging procedure in a fakia, but it is a good, one, a good compromise in a fakia uh, in terms of uh, ease of procedure and good outcome. A little bit of modification, a little bit of innovation can uh, get a good outcome after the surgery. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rajesh. It's so really an excellent talk. Before we move on to the next speaker, I'll ask Gaurav Lutra, any comments you'd like to give Gaurav? Gaurav, unmute. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah, now I can hear you. Okay, great. So I wanted to congratulate all the speakers for those amazing talks. And you know, what I'm really amazed by is that <clears> for a cornea <throat> webinar like this, we have across all platforms between Facebook, IRSI and the web, almost 5,000 viewers from across the world. And, uh, you know, we are reaching out to a huge number. I never thought in Cornea we'll do that. Uh, we do have a couple of questions also which are coming up. And I think because we are running late on time, we can put the questions at the end of the yeah. talks. Thank you very much, Gaurav. I have Vishal Janji. I see him also there with us. So, Vishal, big hello to you, Vishal. A few Hi, comments. Sorry, yeah, Vishal, then we'll go on to the next speaker. Sorry, a comment from you. Well, you know, so I've, I've, I've known most of these uh, excellent presenters for such a long time. And, you know, all the surgeries are amazing. Sophie's technique was really, really amazing. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, these are really complex cases. Uh, I completely agree with what Elmer said earlier, that DSEC has still got a very important place. Uh, one thing that I, you know, that is sometimes missing, at least here in Pittsburgh, I can tell you is, from fellows training, we still, you know, try and tell them, let's start with a DSEC first before you want to graduate to a DMEC. Um, you know, and the techniques that that uh, that have been shown, it just just sort of highlights the variability of each technique. Yet, an excellent result at the end of the day. I, I have been using Bucin's glide, and I'm sorry I joined in a bit late. Uh, I didn't know who presented before Elmer. Uh, I've been using Pearson's Glide since my fellowship back in Melbourne, and I've had excellent results. Um, you know, hardly any, any endothelial cell loss, any significant endothelial cell loss. Let me correct myself. 
Um, so th that's another technique that, that has always worked. And, uh, you know, Namratha and, and Rajesh and Rasik Vajpayee, they've all been my mentors back in India and then in Australia. And, you know, Beast and Glide uh, has always been a popular technique. Uh, even in the United States here, uh, we use it all the time. Thank um, you very much, Vishal. It's really yeah. nice to have you here with us. Well, we are moving on to the next speaker. So before I move on, introduce the next speaker, I'd like to tell all the delegates who are watching, please send in your questions. I know there's a huge global audience, which Gaurav Luthra has been telling me from all over the world, watching this EK webinar. We will be answering all your questions. Now, coming on to the next speaker, we have with us Namrata Sharma. So before I introduce her, I'd like to tell you one thing about her. I think it was Namrata who was instrumental into webinars and surgeons, not today, not during COVID time, but three years back. She was way ahead of everyone, you know. And today she is one of the key persons with Mahipal Sachdev from AI was the president and she's the secretary and Rajesh Sinha is the treasurer who are spearheading these webinar movements, educating all during this COVID crisis. Now we'll have to ask her to speak to us on intraoperative OCD guided DMEC and PDEC. Namrata, all yours. Thank you, Amar, and thank you for organizing this uh, webinar uh, with such galaxy of speakers. I would be talking to you about IOCT guided DMEC and PDEC. And there are no financial or proprietary interests. And uh, this is how a DMEC donor is prepared. And we have to prepare our own tissues, unlike in US. So it always helps if you have an IOCT, although I would say that for preparing the DMEC, perhaps you don't need it that much uh, because the the dismatch membrane is stained with the trapan blue dye and so you can see as the dismatch membrane is being stripped but uh, as you lay it back onto the surface and uh, put it back again there for a s-shaped stamp then it does uh, help you there so after uh, stripping this a three millimeters uh, punch is made and the dismatch membrane is then laid back again on the surface which also can be picked up on the ioct and then subsequently, when you lay it back, you know that there are no gaps present between the desmets membrane. And when you uh, open that lid, uh, after flipping the uh, corneoscleral rim, you can see it looks like a desmetoseal actually. And then you flip it back again, and you make a S-shaped mark there. Actually, if you do have a IOCT, you probably wouldn't need S-shaped mark, but uh, in hazy cornea, sometimes both, of, both the things are required and it kind of helps. And this is uh, followed by the trephination and then subsequently the uh, graft is uh, stripped. Now this is a case of uh, fixed dystrophy for which the cataract surgery has already been done. And even if you've not uh, put an S-shaped mark there, uh, you can still make out the orientation of the graft. The desmet when you're doing the desmetorexis, if there are any desmet membrane tags which are remaining, uh, one can address them looking at the IOCT and can remove every bit of tag there. And then this is the desmet membrane role which had previously been fashioned this is taken into the injector and uh, this is uh, then uh, uh, intracamerally injected into the anterior chamber and when it goes inside the anterior chamber you can actually see the configuration of the graft and you have to get this configuration of the graft correct so when you look at the configuration you know that it is not the correct it's still folded and as you flip it up uh, it's it's upside down now completely so there's no s-shaped stamp but you can make out it's upside down so some more fluid is injected so that the correct orientation is now up and then uh, you have to unfold it, get it to the center and then put that uh, air bubble there and you know that the graft is quite stuck to the back of the cornea and you can't even make out where the graft is. So this is the same case, uh, visual equity of 2020 at week uh, one and it's difficult to make out a graft just like in any DMAC case. Now in hazy corneas particularly, it is very useful for instance this and we published this just uh, this month so again, all the uh, uh, remnants of the Desmet's membrane, which you can't see through the hazy cornea, can be addressed looking at the IOCT. And then again, the DMEC graft is uh, placed inside. Now there's an S-shaped stamp there, but you can't make out, uh, you know, where uh, the S is looking. So, but, but by the configuration of the graft here, now you know that the orientation is correct. And you know uh, that uh, it's endothelial side down. And uh, this is how this intraoposity uh, microscope is useful because the S cannot be uh, deciphered. Very faintly, you can make it out here now, but the, the folding, the pattern of the graft can be uh, deciphered. So this is uh, the post-op uh, picture. Over a period of time, it does clear up. Then uh, 
this is a case where a failed uh, DSEC uh, wa was there because in, in a case where penetrating keratoplasty was done. So you can look at the configuration of both the wounds, the PK wound as well as the DSEC wound. And uh, this failed graft is being removed with the help of the uh, uh, with the help of the reverse Sinsky hook and notice that there's some iris which is adhering uh, to the back of the graft which you can also see on the IOCT and very gently this is uh, removed out and then when you are actually taking the graft into your injector you can see it is upside down so you get it to the correct position before actually putting it in uh, this uh, uh, cannula and then this is inserted inside and again by looking at the configuration and in this we also had the S so uh, by looking at the configuration of the graft, uh, you know which is the correct side up. Uh, and uh, subsequently, this can be then uh, centered uh, in position. And then uh, the uh, air can be injected. So the correct S is looking at you. And the configuration is also uh, of the role is also correct. So you know that you are in the right direction. So it is useful for these cases. Again, for eye syndromes, it's useful because you can actually see the adherence of the iris to the back of the cornea. Uh, not that you can't see otherwise. You can see otherwise also. It only thing is it makes it a little bit clearer. And sometimes these dense adhesions are present, which remain, especially bits and bits of tissue, which are present and connecting and communicating between the iris and the uh, overlying uh, cornea can be uh, very nicely uh, seen through this. And uh, all the remnants are uh, removed. It may not be possible to remove the entire thing piecemeal. So bit by bit, one can remove it and again inject the uh, graft intrahemorrhally. And then with the help of the air, uh, uh, the graft sticks to the back of the cornea. And this is the post-op picture in a case of eye syndrome. Now, sometimes there are poles which are present in the uh, DMAC graft. Now, for instance, in this case, the desmetorexis was done. And this was followed by the uh, injection of the graft uh, inside and uh, the graft was uh, centered and when the graft was being centered actually air bubble was injected hoping that uh, uh, the, the fold will not be there but uh, as soon as the air bubble was uh, injected the fold still continued to be there so in these cases it is extremely useful because you can actually inject the uh, you can notice that there's a there's a fold present there so you go uh, above that fold, inject a little bit of fluid and from the other side, inject air bubble. So that fold gets unfolded by looking at the intra-op OCT microscope and doing this maneuver. And by the IOCT, you know that uh, the uh, you are in the correct plane. Uh, the fluid is injected in the correct plane and the air is also injected in the correct plane. And then uh, when the air bubble is uh, injected subsequently, now this fold is kind of disappeared. So it helps to fi fine tune your uh, surgery and uh, this is PDEC, again, it is useful here. So this is the air bubble, uh, which is being uh, uh, formed, uh, the big bubble uh, technique, which is described by Amar, very useful, especially because it expands the, uh, expands the number of tissues that you can use for an endothelial keratoplasty, tissues which you cannot use for DMEC, you can use for PDEC. And again, uh, the strap and blue staining of this is done followed by the excision of the graft, which is done with the help of the Vana scissors. And uh, uh, after removing the graft, this can then be placed uh, inside the uh, Petri dish. And then uh, subsequently, uh, this is a case of, uh, again, a pseudophagic bullous keratopathy from which the epithelium is removed, uh, followed by desmetorexis. And then the graft, the PDEC graft, which had initially been uh, uh, fashioned is then uh, taken, is injected inside, and then if there are little bit remnants which are there, which one can also see, and every single uh, piece of the desmets membrane can be actually removed, and the graft is then injected, and this is a PDEC graft. It behaves a little differently because it's a splintered graft, so uh, uh, it, it, it's uh, much more controlled as opposed to a DMEC graft, which kind of dances, uh, and air bubble is injected. And this is followed by the, uh, the and this, this subsequently uh, leads to the sticking of the graft to the back of the cornea. And uh, this is uh, the post-op picture of the same. As the epithelization improves, the corneal clarity gets better. And uh, these are just some of the cases which are done under IOCT guided, using IOCT uh, guided techniques. And I'm sure uh, it just helps to fine tune the thing, although it makes no difference 
with good clinical surgeons uh, like we have on the panel. So uh, DMAC and PDEC both combined allow the use of all the tissues uh, irrespective of the age, irrespective of the pathology and refinements and techniques and modifications will continue to occur. So thank you for your uh, kind attention. Thank you very much, Namrata. I think you've introduced us to this intraoperative OCD and you have one of the first to move into this technology, which is really excellent and introduced us now also to PDEC. So let's take it to the next level. And perhaps Ashwin will talk to us on PDEC, the tips and tricks. Ashwin? Yeah, Dr. Namrata, can you just stop the share? Yeah, I'm just trying to do that. It's on top. Uh, yeah, I'm doing it. Yes. Thank you. All right. All right. My topic uh, today is uh, PDEC. And I think I'll explain a little bit about PDEC. I'll just share my screen. I hope everybody can see my screen. Yes. OK. Uh, first of all, thank you, uh, All India, and uh, thank you, IRSI, for having me on this uh, panel. I think it's been absolute learning for me as well on this beautiful uh, discussion on endothelial keratoplasty. So all you need to know about PDEC, I have no financial interest in any of my uh, topics today. Uh, I want to go with a little bit of history and just start off with where it started off in 20 2014. Harminder Dua came out with a new layer. Uh, and discovered that there was something new in the cornea, a sixth layer. Uh, how does this layer change things for us? How do you think it redefined uh, corneal surgery a little bit in its own way? Well, a uh, PDEC membrane basically is a 25 micron membrane. This popping pressure already mentioned earlier before about 766. It does pop, and but it does not cross beyond 9 to 10 millimeters. And that's something very important to understand. Let's go a little deeper. Let's understand DMEC. You see the DMEC bubble starts from the periphery and then goes to the center. That's what a DMEC bubble does. Just the opposite of a PDEC bubble, that is the type 1 bubble. So here we are, type 1 bubble, which is the PDEC bubble, type 2, which is the DMEC, and type 3, sometimes you get a combination of both, which is uh, ideal, not very ideal, and you can't actually use that. You probably could use the DMEC tissue in that and not the PDEC. Uh, how does this uh, change things in a harvesting point of view? You can actually take a PDEC tissue, the donor age independent, which is basically one year or two years as well, which probably you can't do in a DMEC tissue as the stroma and the uh, pre-desmase are uh, attached a bit too strong. Uh, these are some of the electronic uh, images that we got from Dua himself. And if you see the small arrows on the left, uh, that's the pre-desmase layer. And the big arrow is the desmase and the endothelial layer. So here's a pneumatic dissection. Why am I showing you pneumatic dissection? Because that's how today we harvest uh, the PDEC tissue. And I'll just show you in a bit how this is done. The PDEC graft preparation. Uh, this is in steps, but here's a video that shows the same. We take a 30 gauge needle with uh, a bubble when the pneumatic dissection starts increasing the intracorneal pressure. You actually get a good bubble. Once you have this bubble, you pierce in with a knife or a uh, side port knife push some trypan blue into the bubble, and now circumferentially cut all around. This is if you want to do this manually. Uh, in the US, for my US colleagues, I think there are uh, options available, and I'll show you that as well in images for now, but it's a, should somebody want to see more of this, there are uh, S-stamped PDEC uh, tissues available from many eye banks over there. If this is how they do. This is a friend of mine, Mark Soper, who uh, from Indianapolis. He kind of was helpful enough to send me his images of how he is doing this. Basically, trefining from top using an artificial anterior chamber maintainer and uh, taking off that tissue from top and making an S stamp into the bubble. If you see here, what I'm trying to show here is the bubble actually stays. In a DMEC tissue, that bubble will not stay uh, if you have an open uh, trefination point over there. Uh, these are some of the differences between the uh, post pre-desmase layer and the posterior stroma. This is just for a snapshot. It's should somebody want to see this at a later point? This is only in interest of time. I'm moving on to showing you the recipient preparation. How does the recipient and how we do it a little differently uh, with the help of uh, uh, an, a trocar and an endo eliminator. So here's a, a pseudophagic bullous keratopathy case. Uh, after taking off the epithelium to improve visualization, I basically am putting in a trocar uh, first, first I fix my trocar AC maintainer in. Once my trocar is inside the eye, 
I put in continuous air infusion. So once I have continuous air infusion, I always know that I can actually visualize the uh, the margins of the watch this over here with an endo illuminator and a trocar with air infusion inside. When two Rusinski hooks, I can visualize the margin of that stripping very, very clearly. And you can do this even if you're doing a DMAC case. Honestly speaking, I found this very helpful in terms of seeing the tangential light when it hits the edge of that uh, Desmet strip. It really gives a sheen, a sheen to it, which really helps me uh, improve my visualization before I can strip each tags, pieces, you know, the small, sometimes these don't come in a, a full piece. They come in piecemeal and some of these tags can be disastrous when it comes to uh, reattaching or attaching the donor button, the donor graph. Now I'm making my wounds and keeping my, uh, keeping it prepped up and that's filling it back with uh, some saline. Next up, I'm preparing the injector system, basically removing the spring from the injector cartridge, putting that silicon uh, tip back now, just like how I would in a DMEC tissue, uh, nothing changes except uh, except that the graft is different. So here's my prep up ready. Now with saline inside the eye, I push, I shallow the chamber as is in a DMEC case I would do as well. The trocar inside the eye, I shallow the chamber. Now here's the only difference. I do a bubble and I can actually use my reverse Sinsky, which probably I cannot do in a DMAC tissue. The reason being the DMAC tissue would tear like a tin foil, a small thin tin foil, it would tear. And that is something that I'm using here because this PLEC tissue has this advantage of this posterior stroma, which is really, really strong. The tensile strength of this PDEC tissue is extremely strong. In fact, if anybody has a chance to actually see a PDEC tissue or feel it, can try and pull apart a PDEC tissue and pull apart a DMEC tissue and test its own tensile strength. The guys in the US, when I taught them about this uh, in the eye banks, they were surprised to see that th we had this all under our noses. This is the pre-op uh, and post-op picture of the same patient I just showed you, 45 days post-op. Uh, and this is a three week post-op of the same patient. Comparisons between the PDEC, DMEC, and uh, DSEC. Again, this is not for me. This is basically for the viewers. But the most important point over here I would like to stress upon is the donor age independency of uh, PDEC and DSEC, uh, which is very important in, in the differentiating factor between DMEC and P, uh, PDEC because the endothelial cell count will be off the charts when you have a younger donor. One thing I'll leave you off with, and I think Dr. Amar is going to talk a lot more about difficult situations, and this is a really difficult situation, is when you have to do, uh, I think Dr. Rajesh Sinha also spoke very well about this in Ifekias and in really complex uh, scenarios. You really have to lay a foundation, and a foundation can be laid by doing a glued IOL in these aphakic patients and uh, doing a pupilloplasty. These two tricks I have helped improve the results of endothelial keratoplasty in a humongous way. And I think uh, I'm going to leave this with showing you a small animation of why this helps is because when you push air to push that graft on, the air actually goes into the posterior segment and that's something you don't want. What you really want is if you've done a pupiloplasty and a glue diol, this acts like a scaffold as what Dr. Rajesh already mentioned and helps hold that graft in place for the next four or five days, which really is where you really want to uh, benefit from these procedures. Thank you very much and uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Ashwin. So before I ask Namrata to take over moderation again, I'd just like a few comments from Rajesh Fogla and from Terry Kim. Uh, Rajesh? Hi. Yes, excellent presentation and nice videos. Uh, this uh, PIDEC is definitely useful when it comes to younger tissue. The only disadvantage is that you don't get the ideal size of the donor. The so overall size is somewhere between 7, 7.5. And the edges, uh, because you have to manually cut with scissors, you often tend to have some stromal tissue at the edge as well. Uh, we tried doing this technique back uh, in 2013, 14, when it was, uh, it was initially described as a hybrid DMEC. Uh, the overall outcomes, visual outcomes, were not as good as uh, DMAC in the immediate post-operative. But I'm sure if you follow up these patients over a period of six months to one year, definitely the vision would get better. However, the other thing that we do with younger tissues now is ultra-thin DSEC. So if we have a younger donor 
and we are unable to do a DMAC, we would mount that on an artificial chamber, use the microkeratin to prepare an ultra thin graft and use it for ultra thin DSEC, which actually, uh, which also works very well. Thank you, Rajesh. What about Terry? Well, no, first of all, I just want to congratulate all the speakers on their excellent presentations. I mean, anyone, I think, uh, even if they're beginning DSEC, DMAC, PDEC surgeon, or intermediate advanced are going to get some great pearls from this. Um, you know, just some general thoughts. Um, um, I think for me, um, as I mentioned earlier, I'm using DSEC still primarily for my complex cases, but to me, the biggest prognostic indicator for successful DSEC uh, cases, if I can get that air tamponade and that pressure very high, and I liked uh, Dr. Singha's technique very much in that uh, I'm going to try that in uh, aphakic patients. But that to me is the most important, contrary to DMAC, where I don't think you need to have that high tamponade. And then also uh, very important, I think, afterwards is the pupil IOP um, um, monitoring after these patients. Um, I think it's important. For instance, in DSEC, I still do uh, a, a very high tamponade for about seven seven to eight minutes in the operating room. And then I hold these patients for an hour uh, laying back in the post-op holding area. Quite different from DMEC where I'm still using 20% uh, SF6 and just doing uh, maybe a th two to three minute tamponade in the operating room, um, very short post-operably. Uh, but monitoring their, their pupil and their bubble and their intraocular pressure post-operably uh, is uh, very important. So Thank one you very question, much. One question I have for uh, Dr. Rajesh Fogla. Uh, uh, Rajesh, how many percentage of cases now? What's your percentage of DSEC and DMEC? What's the ratio between? Well, the well, we try and do a DMEC in almost all the cases, but when faced with a uh, with a complex case with shallow anterior chamber peripheral sinicae, we're doing in a DMEC maybe a little bit challenging. I think my next go-to procedure is ultra thin DSEC. So I would say about 90% uh, DMAC and 10% ultra thin DSEC. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I would now like to invite uh, Dr. Amar Agarwal to give his talk on uh, PDEC in difficult situations. A PDEC, a technique which was pioneered by him a uh, few years ago and has uh, stood the test of the time and is especially useful because it it suddenly expands the number of tissues that you can use for endothelial keratoplasty. Thank you very much, Namrata. I hope I'm on screen there for you. Yes. Okay, so it's on full screen? Yes. So basically, if you see here in this case, I'm taking a very tough case. This patient is a pseudophagic bullous keratopathy case. Now, I prepared flaps there for glued IOL. I'm also making a scleral tunnel because as you will realize, I'm taking off this epithelium and you will see behind that an anterior chamber IOL. So obviously I need to explant that AC IOL. I always have fluid in the eye. So you notice I've got a fluid now fixed inside the eye there. Some of my flaps were not 180 degrees, so I'm just making it exactly 180 degrees apart, which is extremely important. Now, all such complicated cases, I always do a good vitrectomy. And even through such hazy corneas, you will notice I'll do a posterior vitrectomy because I do not know if the surgeon has done some mistake, like dropping a nucleus or an IOL or something inside. Now, once I've done that, I'm going to now remove this AC IOL. The problem which I see in these AC IOLs are, they get stuck to the iris. So you have to remove them very carefully so that we notice there is no extra damage to the iris created. You can see it's coming out in pieces. Slowly, I've removed one by one there, and you can see there, pieces coming out of the optic and the haptic, but still some haptic is still inside. So I'm removing that. And I still see one more haptic behind, which is lodged onto the iridectomy. So I'm trying to remove it carefully so that I don't create an extra bleed in that. But notice while removing that, small bleed is there. That's why I always keep fluid in the eye so that there's a nice tamponade always happening. Now, once I have done this, my next step is to do a glued IOL. So I'm going to fix my IOL always in place there. So I cast the haptic. I'm using it like a non-foldable technique, very simple because I already have a large incision. One haptic in, out. Now I go in for the other one through the handshake technique, transfer the haptic from one hand to the other, externalize it. So you can see the handshake technique working very effectively. Look at the amount of haptic externalized. It's a lot. So I take a 26 gauge needle, create the shariest pocket, 
and tuck it inside. Now, so far, so good. Now, my next step is to do the fourth row pupillary. And I'm just going to show it to you just now. Take a straight needle proline from one side. From the other side, take a 30 gauge needle through a paracentesis. Railroad the two. Once you have railroaded the two, bring the loop out. And Rajesh Sinha talked about this, and Ashwin also talked about it. Now, remember the number four. All you do is pass four times. That's all. So, this is a single pass only, and four times you have done it. So, it's a four throw pupiloplasty. Normally, you do second pass, third pass. Every time you do a pass, you'll have chance of damaging the cornea, the IUL, or something like that. In this instance, a single pass is very simple. Here you can see I'm doing this. Now, what is the advantage of this? One, I made the pupil small so that the air does not go back. Second, the closed angle, if there is, will become an open angle. Three, I've also created like a pinhole type of an effect now, if you notice, so that if there is any sort of an astigmatism, that also gets neutralized. So looking at all these reasons, why I feel in such complicated cases, you are better off with the pupiloplasty. And single pass fourth row makes life very easy. Now, once I have done that, I'm putting in air to see if my bubble remains inside. It's remaining inside nicely. Now I take my PDEC preparation. So remember for PDEC preparation, I'm taking a 30 gauge needle. I'm going to inject. You're looking at the endothelium, ladies and gentlemen, all of you. So once I do that, see the bubble? I've just gone in from the sclera, injected air inside. This is a type one bubble, as Ashwin talked about. It does not go to the periphery. So where is the air? You have endothelium, you have desmase, then you have the pre-desmase or duas layer, then the air. So this is the type one bubble. If it went to the periphery, then it would be a DMEC bubble or a type 2 bubble. That means you will have endothelium, desmase, air, and then pre desmase layer. So now once you have done this, just cut it in, just like how Namrata also showed in her presentation. I've injected some tripan blue inside to stain it. Now all I need to do to dissect it inside and dissect the graph. Now, I also fix another cannula this time. Look, the first one was behind for fluid. This is a double infusion cannula. The reason is, in cases which are vitrectomized, people don't do DMEX. For us, we only do PDEX. We don't do, do any DSEX. We don't do DMEX. But the advantage with this double infusion cannula is the fluid from the back will push the iris IOL diaphragm anteriorly. And the one in the front will have air pump assisted PDEX going on. So I have air continuously inside the eye. Now, all I need to do is take off this bad endothelium desmase, just like you will do a normal endothelial keratoplasty. So once I have done that, remove this, all I need to do is take my PDEC graph into any injector system, whichever one you're using, like in DMEX, same story, inject it inside. Once you have injected inside, we use an endo eliminator to check which side is right and which side is wrong. Inject some air inside. Now, once air is inside, the graft is attached at this time on the air pump on. So I've got my air continuously inside the eye and I can center it. Look how I can move the graft. You can't do that in a DMEC. The advantage is, one, I can use young donor. Two, I can move it wherever I want. And I can manipulate it so I can easily manipulate the whole graph. Now, I've taken off my two infusion cannulas. That's how the case completed. Now, the question comes, how did this patient behave? So let's look at how this case looks at the end of the day. Look at the patient, two weeks post-op. And you can see the pre-order picture, one month post-op. And now you can see the patient again two months post-op and look at the picture now three months post-op 2020 vision and finally you'll see here the patient now nine months post-op so the last thing which i thought i'll just show you here is i'll just one second go back to my uh thing here and just if you can just see that you can see the book there so this is the, are you catching it, Namrata? Yeah. Okay, this is the book which we have been published on uh, PDEC, which has been published by us, by uh, the JP brothers also. And I thought we'll just mention this to you. So this is the basic thing which I, we see in PDEC. The reason why we don't do DMEX and we don't do DSEX is for the simple reason, we are getting young donors to the manipulation is so easy. So we don't take any donor above 35 to 40 years. All our donors will be below that only. And approximately, we see that the results are so good. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Amar, uh, for that great talk. And uh, there's one question which has come up, uh, and I would ask uh, Dr. Yu for that uh, question. If there's an NIRED and AFIC here both, how would you manage it? I mean, what would be your approach? Combine oh, well, NIRED and AFIC here. Sure. So that's a little bit more challenging simply because if the patient is anaerobic and it's something that's congenital, they've been able to manage the glare, that's one consideration. Um, if it is a possibility that um, they also want that iris repaired and there's not enough iris root in order to fashion any form of uh, protection there, then I would definitely suggest using a prosthetic platform where you can also sew the prosthesis um, onto the actual lens itself do a scleral fixation of that process and then consider some form of an endothelial keratoplasty. In my opinion, in a case that becomes this complex, especially when you are creating such a, um, a large wound, et cetera, I do think that going the route of slightly thicker tissue in the form of an ultra-thin or a nano-thin DSEC is preferable to me versus going uh, PDEC and DMEC, but that is just my own comfort level per se. Not that that obviously based on these wonderful presentations is that an absolute necessity by any means. Thank you. Thank you so much. Another question for Dr. Elmer too. Would you share your comments on AC maintainer? Uh, Elmer is there? In, ter in terms of an AC maintainer for... Yeah, what do you think? I mean, should it be threaded or should it be... How would you... I mean, it. I use a threaded one because it can be shorter on the entry and it's self-retaining so that I don't have to, you know, I worry sometimes if it's not threaded that it may back out at, at an inopportune time. <laughs> so. One thing I tell you, and Amrita on this is, we use the Trukar AC maintainer. So the advantage is the Trukar AC maintainer which you design goes through the sclera. So it does not damage the cornea at all. You know, so you're passing through sclera, but approximately a half millimeter from the sclera. Sclera is very forgiving compared to the cornea. So when you pull it out, you're absolutely safe and clear on that. And there's one question I think we'll take it up from all the panelists. For what or what percentage of cases do you do venting incisions? Uh, it would be zero for me. Benny Jane? Be... So Benny... I, I, you know, I said that we shouldn't do it except under extraordinary circumstances. I, right now it's zero for me, but I know that there are occasions where, where some of the presenters have justifiably said that it'd be beneficial, Dr. but I do Dr. Barry Lee? Uh, I, can, can you hear me? Yes. I don't, I don't yes. use venting incisions either. Liz? I will do venting incisions if there's extreme difficulty with visualization and a failed cornea, not so much in um, a Fuchs dystrophy patient. Um, but I will only place two because I do believe that if you place a tripod effect, it could create a little more irregular astigmatism. And I'm very specific about being 180 degrees apart. I do, in those cases, have a denuded epithelium as well. Vishal? Yeah, I think about the same in complicated cases. Uh, take off the epithelium and then do venting incisions. I would say that's that's about one third of my cases. One third. Okay. Namrata, just a quick. When I used to do them, I learned a a trick with the venting incisions was actually to put them in before you put the graft in, because once the graft is in and you're putting in the venting incisions, it's very hard to make them straight. And so, uh, doing the venting incisions before you place the graft when the eye is pressurized well will at least result in more normal incisions. Mm -hmm. Dr. Sophie Dang, Sophie? Um, no, I, I um, don't use a venting incision anymore. Okay, and Terry Kim? I actually am using venting incisions, but I think the key is doing it in an eye that's very highly pressurized. And I use a very sharp blade that has an angle like this. So the, the amount of opening actually is very small when you get to the posterior cornea, which minimizes the risk, uh, hopefully, of any kind of um, epithelial ingrowth. And Rajesh, I know yeah. you use venting I, I, I do it in only in AFK guys when I'm combining all the procedures, like doing a blue dye well, as well as iris reconstruction, and doing an ultra thin DSEC. In those cases, I use venting incisions. And Amar and Susan and Ashwin, I don't think you use. We never do. You never need to do. So <laughs> one more question before we take up the last presentation. And that is, what is the difference? And this is for three of you. What is the difference between an ultra thin DSEC and a PDEC, according to you? I mean, some people tend to think that it is Microns. an extreme See, form of ultra go, thin DSEC. 
if you want to go actually the thinnest will be uh, after dmec is going to be the pdec because in pdec you are having desmase endothelium and the predesmase layer that's it there is no stroma now in ultra thin dsec whatever you do whether it is 60 micron or whatever you are doing it you are going to have stroma in it so my suggestion to people is the advantage which i see in pdec is you don't have any stroma at all it's actually simple you just need a simple needle 30 gauge and all you need is the graft to do it issue is why we take only young donors is because i feel basically there's a huge difference if you see the cases which you are showing are not simple fukes there are very complicated cases like i showed you or what ashwin or what susan is going to show you these cases i think are better off with pdex so when we started doing dmex and dsex and now pdex we have stopped doing dsex we have stopped doing dmex the only thing i tell people is first prepare your graft if my bubble does not come i will postpone the case i don't mind but i prepare the graft properly then only i will go in for the surgery sometimes how do you control the air? sometimes you inject the air and the bubble bursts yeah so if it bursts so that's what i'm saying if the bub by chance the bubble bursts you know then what you can do is we we'll, we have another graft it's okay otherwise i'll postpone the case the patient will not come inside the or unless my graft is ready so i'm very clear that the bubble has to be very good clear i get a nice graft and then i only i'm tracked for the surgery susan has got a nice trick which you'll talk to about on the fluid also susan I just so, want to add something for the US on uh, the uh, people abroad. I think uh, the PDEC graph. When I started teaching the people in the I banks in the US, what happened was they actually found it a big boon because they were actually throwing away those graphs for uh, for no reason, and they found it a big boon to actually start reusing those graphs for PDEC tissue. Uh, unfortunately, it's not been it's not been popularized too much yet in terms of uh, people actually asking for the graph. but uh, there's a huge uh, area where there's scope for improvement in terms of using reutilizing those grafts which are going waste at that age group and also lions i institute all these other uh, i banks are giving ready made pdex grafts which are s stamped and right. stained so they right. come to you ready made all you need to do is ask the i bank i want a pdex or a dmec but if you are asking for a pdex what i tell everyone in the united states or anywhere in the world who's listening to me please ask them for a young donor because that will be the biggest advantage which you'll get and the manipulation this dmec dancing and all no we don't even worry about it we don't have that problem at all in pdec so whenever you are asking in the i bank ask them for a young donor under 40 and you'll be able to get that from you in your hand so i think one thing which needs to get standardized is the cutting of the graft because as konya uh, konya specialists we all are wary about you know touching the edge of the graft with the with the uh, scissors so I think that is something which needs to be standardized. I'd, I'd like to make so, a comment here. One, uh, one was about the size, about whether the bubble will burst. Uh, what I've seen is that, uh, uh, yeah, or rather, what I do is that I start the bubble with uh, air, and then I take off the air, and then uh, change over to trepan blue, which means I'm going to expand the bubble with trepan. Now, when you do that, you can go much more slowly uh, and in a more controlled manner than with air. and so you can actually see it expanding and get it to a size you want i always kind of uh, before every surgery try to estimate the size of graft that i need and i take a caliper and you know put it over the not without touching but just hold it over the graft to kind of can you hear me yeah yeah we can hear you but susan can you actually control the size of the bubble yeah that that's what i'm coming to that's what i'm coming to so uh, if you if you want at one point you'll see the fibers start to kind of stretch out you can actually see that difference when you're doing it with uh, trepan blue Uh, the, the graph kind of takes a different appearance uh, the the predesmet fibers and that lets you know that if you're going to go on injecting more and more it might burst so that's the point at which i like to stop and also you feel a greater resistance to uh, putting the trepan blue in so these are kind of two uh, tips that would kind of let you know after you've done a a certain number of cases that it's time to stop injecting now i just and add another thing i'd like to say is also that you can get much larger graft it's not always 7 7.5 in fact i've got grafts as large as 9 mm sometimes uh, and that's not too infrequent either so you can get large graft with pdec i think uh, uh, the only thing is that you cannot always say in which donor i you're going to get uh, 7.5 or 9 but uh, generally if you see the corneoscleral uh, if you measure the white to white diameter of the cornea and it's a small eye you're likely to get a smaller graft and if it's a larger eye you're likely to get a large graft so that's a a, a way that you can kind of uh, guess before you actually inject that you'll uh, get a large graft 7 7.5 is 7.5 is generally easy to get in every eye so with this uh, we come to the last talk of the session and that is air pump assisted pdec and uh, uh, pre desmet endothelial keratoplasty in field penetrating keratoplasty thank you uh i'm just going to turn on my screen share
Sorry, just a bit. Mm -hmm. Okay, can you uh, see my desktop now? Is my uh, is yeah. my screen all right? Uh, yeah. Okay. So uh, thank you so much uh, for uh, organizing this uh, this symposium, uh, Dr. Namrata and Dr. Amar. It's uh, really nice to participate in this. My talk is going to be on pre-dismissed endothelial keratoplasty on a failed penetrating keratoplasty. I have no financial interest in this topic of presentation. We know that uh, uh, thin membrane endothelial keratoplasties, which is a term that I like to use for uh, DMEC and PREC combined, are generally preferred all over the world because of various advantages that they have, like better visual acuity, less refractive error induction, and so on and so forth, better patient satisfaction. But they are generally more difficult to perform, and you do have a higher detachment rate than uh, with DZIC. So a lot of uh, uh, surgeons prefer to do uh, DZEC in complex anterior segment situations, which include aphakic eyes, eyes, sutured or glued intraocular lenses, eyes with large iris defects on aniridia, as was just mentioned here, glaucoma drainage devices, or eyes where you also have large incisions uh, done simultaneously, for example, SICS, ECC, or explantation of IOL. And precautions that are taken in such cases include use of long-acting gases, such as SF6 or C3F8, anchoring sutures, and the size of the desmetorex is being made larger or equal, and of course, these are in complex cases. Now, coming to uh, specifically uh, OPK, or uh, a failed graft, a failed penetrating keratoplasty, this is how I make my graft, and this is how I just discussed. So I've made it with air, and I'm going to expand it with uh, trepan blue and uh, without touching the graph you can get a rough estimate of what the size is going to be i'm just going to pause this graph here we normally cut with scissors but uh, the th the tip to remember here uh, dr namrata as you asked is that you don't hold the scissor vertically you actually hold it horizontally so it's lying on the base of the cornea and there's very little edge touch actually around now that's important if you hold the scissor vertically or in an oblique manner you are going to get endothelial cell loss because you'll possibly remove it all around but if you hold it lying flat and use a curved vanas uh, your uh, chance of any kind of endothelial cell loss is going to be very less. But in a penetrating keratoplasty, I actually like to use a trephine to cut the graft in a PDEC also, and that's actually simple to do. What I do is I deflate the bubble by just withdrawing the air, and then once I've deflated it, I take the size of the trephine that I want and punch it. The reason I do this is because in penetrating keratoplasty, it's very crucial to get your uh, PDEC graft of exact right size. You don't want to oversize uh, and thereby, um, sorry, you don't want to oversize and thereby result in a uh, a detachment post-operatively. So in these cases, I like to do a trephine. Sometimes, uh, now here it is, it's, it may be a little difficult to get it exactly centered. So you might have to cut a part of it with, uh, with a scissor, but you can try and center it as much as possible. And it really doesn't matter if you have a teeny bit of stroma. You need to go superficial though. When you're cutting that part, you have to make sure that you don't take too much stroma inside. Now, okay, sorry. Coming to the next slide. So uh, these are three techniques which I have described. Uh, one is the air pump assisted PDEC, the e PDEC, and the hose decimatic scaffolding. And over uh, many hundreds and hundreds of cases which I've done now, I've realized that these three techniques have really helped me do this uh, surgery in a very, very repeatable manner. I'm going to show you these three techniques. Uh, this is the air pump assisted uh, PDEC technique, which I published in Jaker in Konya in 2017. And uh, this is a case of a PDEC in a failed graft. And uh, these are the three techniques, as I said, that I like to use. And uh, I'm going to show you all these three techniques one by one. So here's the graft. Uh, important tips, when you make this incision, make sure that you're not going to touch the graft hose junction because uh, you don't want to disturb that junction. It's nice to always remove the epithelium in tough cases because that gets you good visualization. You can do the rexus here and uh, complete the rexus. You can see some posterior sinecae in, uh, in the pupil. Uh, so these are some of the uh, complex things that you might find, the dilated pupil or posterior sinecae in eyes that have previously been operated on. Uh, this was a soft cataract, so I've removed it uh, with IA. Uh, in harder cataracts, you can go ahead and use your normal FACO uh, maneuvers. I always use a hydrophobic IOL because I'm going to put in air and I don't want the IOL opacifying. I've uh, put the IOL into the bag. And now this is again important. You remove all the viscoelastic. This is a really crucial step. You have to remove all viscoelastic. And then now this, this is what I want you to know. This is the anti-chamber maintainer. And uh, I basically realized that when I started doing out PDEX that, uh, that it's really important to have this continuous uh, flow of air into the eye. And that helps you keep a well-formed anti-chamber. You don't have that anti-chamber fluctuations that you otherwise have. And this helps you do the surgery in a much more uh, repeatable manner. So I've got this air uh, going into the anterior chamber. And this you can do by connecting it either to a vitrectomy machine or to some of the newer FACO machines. 
And you can see that I'm sorry, doing a dismetorexis. I'll get it back here. I'm doing an air pump assisted dismetorexis, basically an inverse dismetorexis. And the air actually helps you uh, helps you to visualize that uh, that dismetorexis edge really well. And if you also notice, I'm going to make the dismetorexis a little smaller. Now, this I will explain in a later video in greater detail, but uh, you can actually make it a little smaller. Uh, the uh, other advantage, as you saw just now, of the air pump assisted PDEC is that you can, the air, the air the holds air. the anterior chamber open. And so you can actually uh, do a lot of maneuvers inside. For example, there was some uh, re remnant dismets here, which I didn't want there in that particular area. If I want to make it smaller or anything else, I can go in and uh, pull it out with a uh, micro forceps. I've got the graft in there. I've injected into the eye. Again, make sure that it doesn't come out as Sophie had uh, so beautifully explained. Open it. And here is how it's different from PDEC. I'm not bothered. If you look at that, uh, the edges of the graft do not really bother me. So those peripheral edge folds, so I've unfolded the graft almost all over, except for those peripheral edge folds. And this is something that a DMX surgeon might not accept. But uh, I, I do accept this and I've, got, I've learned to have... Uh, very good results. I've got very good results over the years. You've got the air flowing in. You just center the graph just as you do in a DZEC. So you've got all the advantages of DZEC, the maneuverability of DZEC, and the ease of performing DZEC, along with the anatomical and visual outcomes of a DMEC. So you saw me how I centered it. And then I've gone and uh, opened those edge folds, again with air being infused. Uh, and then this this is the same patient one month post-operative. So here's... Uh, the next technique I'd like to show you is the endoilluminator assisted PDEC, which uh, I published in JCRS in 2014. And again, this is a very nice technique, even without the S stamp. I've never used the S stamp in any of my cases. I've never stamped the graft at all because I found the endoilluminator makes all the difference. Uh, even in these hazy, really bad corneas, you can see that this is a really bad cornea. But with that endoilluminator, I'm able to do a FACO. I'm doing the rexus, the peripheral Everything can be done uh, with just the endoilluminator light. And then you go ahead and use your other techniques. Uh, the ones that I just described. You can see see how just with the use of that endoilluminator, everything actually comes into much better clarity than it was previously. You can do all these maneuvers because the air is being pumped in, and so it gives you uh, it gives you that open and stable antechamber, a non-collapsible antechamber rather, and uh, so you can go ahead and go on with your surgery. Uh, let me show you the last technique. All right, sorry. So this is a, a very interesting technique, and this is what I call as the host dysmetic scaffolding. And uh, this could also be used by beginner surgeons, but it's especially useful in all these complex cases. This, together with the air pump tested technique, I would say, in fact, a combination of all these three in all these complex cases uh, to be able to perform uh, them successfully and repeatedly. So this is, again, uh, uh, this is a different eye. This is a penetrating keratoplasty that's being done. It was a child. Again, you can see the posterior sinica. There was a fibr fibrinous membrane, which I first thought was a capsule, and I did a rexus on the fibrinous membrane, and then realized that there was the anterior capsule there again beneath it. So I did a rexus again on the anterior capsule below that. Uh, this is again, uh, this was a 12-year-old child. So I uh, did a FACO with just IA, and I unfortunately I left that superior cortex there, thinking that I would go ahead and get it later after putting the IOL. But I got a PCR, a posterior capture, and now you can see that this is one of the I'm doing an optic capture there, reverse optic capture. But you can see that this is a complex case because I'm doing it on a PK, it's combined with a FACO. There is a PCR, I've got a vitrectomy port there. Uh, so all these things, and it's a dilated pupil, all these things make this a really complex case with a high uh, chance for detachment and post-operative complications. I'm doing a pupiloplasty here, and then I'm, I'm doing an IVT-assisted vitrectomy just to make sure there's no vitreous in the anterior chamber. I've got the air pump going now, and you can see again, I do the dismetorexis. Now in grafts, in grafts, you really need to make sure that your reverse sense key is not digging into that graft host interface because you don't want to open it up or dehesse it out. Uh, you can use this uh, this micro forceps to just go ahead and pull out any tags, uh, and then now you go in and uh, check. You use your EPDEC technique to make sure that the graft is in the right orientation. So that's important. Inject it in, and then uh, use the EPDEC technique again. And you can see that it's beautifully seen without the S stamp. So I've got it there. I've unfolded it. You can see those edge folds which I'm accepting. I float the graft up. It's a decentered graft. Again, I accept that this you would not have done in DMEC. You would do this in DSEC though, and there, that's why PDEC combines these, the advantages of both these techniques beautifully. I've got that uh, graph centered. I'm going to close up those sutures and then open those edge folds. So once it's done, the air is continuously going in and uh, 
as one of the speakers had mentioned earlier, that continuous pressurized air infusion in the eye actually helps the graft to adhere even intraoperatively. So even before you're done with the surgery, your graft is already attached. So there's no question of it detaching postoperatively. This is the child. And, and also, I, I forgot to mention, that was another risk factor for this child, uh, uh, a low scleral region. It was a child, so there was every possibility of this graft not doing well. And in fact, the child, as you saw, postoperatively did very well. So these are uh, now. This is this is just the second part of my video. Uh, this is a different video, and uh, this is just to show that one of the biggest complications of uh, thin membrane endothelial keratoplasties is actually graft detachment. And one of the reasons why this happens is if you have the host dismiss membrane lying above the graft this graft can detach in the postoperative period. And that's the reason everybody makes a larger desmeterexis, a smaller graft and a larger desmeterexis, so that you don't have accidental entrapment of the host desmets membrane above the, above the graft. I'm sorry about that. So uh, now uh, what uh, uh, started, what set me off wondering is, why would you want to leave that desmets membrane above the graft? graph why not have it below the graph so it's actually trapping the graft in place it's, the graft is kind of getting tucked under the host dismiss membrane and that helps you get, helps to get you a scaffold in the post-operative period which again prevents uh, graft detachment so make the gra uh, dismetorix smaller maybe in a few uh, quadrants and then tuck the graft in so that the host dismiss membrane is actually supporting it in the post-operative period so here you can see a case i've done a uh, smaller dismetorix as you can see uh, you can use, as I said, microforceps to try and get it of the desired size exactly. Again, the EP technique showing beautifully how without an S-stamp, you can make out the uh, the orientation without even actually going into the anterior chamber, but just an external non-touch technique. The air pump's been inserted in. You can see those peripheral edge folds. I'm folding, I'm opening up those peripheral edge folds. And now I'm going and teasing that uh, hose desmith membrane out from above the graft to a position that's now going to lie below the graft. So the graph, the hose desmith is going to lie below the graft now. So it's actually with the air pump in uh, place and with the, with the air continuously go, flowing into the antechamber, you can see that the antechamber is held very stable, well open, not collapsing, and that helps you do this many way beautifully. Uh, the other technique that I also uh, have described is wound scaffolding, and this is interesting because one of the panelists said that they would like to have the uh, DZ graph below, and one of them said, I mean, shorter than the wound length, and one of them said that the, uh, they would like to have it longer than the wound length. But in PREC, you can actually do this wound scaffolding technique. And I like this technique because if you have the wound uh, slightly into the graph, it actually, again, acts as a scaffold. Don't have it more than 50%. Make sure it's a big syndrome, but you can have it. And that's what's done here. You can see here and here. And also the host desmetic scaffolding uh, on the sides. And all of this gives you a better... Uh, uh, kind of, you know, getting the graph fixed into place and not detaching postoperatively. Use this in all kinds of complex cases, vitrectomy, vitrectomized eyes, and all these eyes with AGVs where I've uh, been able to uh, perform this surgery with trabeculectomies as seen here, very successfully without any uh, re increased risk of graft detachment. So you can do this in multiple ways. You can either do a bilateral host desmetic scaffolding, which means you have the desmet membrane host desmet supported in two quadrants, or you can have a multi-point host desmetic scaffolding which means you just have a bit, bits and pieces here and there where it's supposed, or you can have a host desmetic scaffolding combined with a wound scaffolding. So all of these help to hold the graft in place. So the, the, the point that I'm coming to is instead of having this gap between the graft and the host, have the host tucked underneath the graft so that it's actually, or rather have the host support the graft from beneath, so it's actually holding it in place. And this actually ASOC shows you beautifully. This is the conventional technique where you have a gap between the graft and the host desmets membrane. And the next OS ASOC is after host decimetic scaffolding, where you have the PDEC graft above and the host decimates membrane nicely tucking. And you can see where the graft, where the, uh, the section has the ASOC has scan has been taken. The PDEC graft holding the uh, host decimates membrane beautifully in place. Here's again the reason why all these techniques are interconnected. I'm sorry, I'll come back here again. The reason why all these techniques are interconnected, and that's that's what happens when you don't have the air pump going. So you can have anterior chamber collapses. Uh, if you don't have the air pump going, but you can do it in a very repeatable way if you have the air pump going. Uh, I'm sorry, actually, yeah, there it is. So again, you can see how the post dismiss can be teased out with the air flowing, and you can get it out into a position to lie beneath the graft, and that holds it in place. And I think you'll see now that the... All right, and here's a little bit of wound scaffolding also being done. Uh, I think that brings me to the end of my video. I just want to show you one more thing. Possibly, I think it was at 420. 
yeah, this is the patient uh, of aniridia, and since this was discussed, and you can see how PDA can also be done beautifully in a patient with aniridia. I think that would be a really uh, case which would be extremely complex. Aniridia uh, uh, and aniridia IOL a failed gra a graph that is failed everything together, and uh, you're you're actually uh, doing all of this and getting good results. The PDA graph does not uh, detach because of all these techniques that have been used, and it's also the the very intrinsic quality of the PDA graph, which is more tougher, robust, and more resilient, uh, allows you to do use all these techniques in a very very beautiful manner. I think that brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Susan, uh, for uh, those videos on PDEC. And uh, so uh, one uh, last message from each of the panelists. Uh, as far as the endothelial keratoplasty is concerned, uh, we'll begin from Terry Kim. What do you say is the future of endothelial keratoplasty? Will we keep juggling between these techniques, or you think there's going to be something you know, which is going to come up, which will replace all of them? or each technique has its you know, own place as of now. So unmute. Very unmute. Let me just thank everyone again for the invitation. Uh, I personally learned a lot and got uh, a lot of great tips um, from it. You know, we've all seen the evolution of these Lamellar techniques uh, improve over the years. Um, and our techniques are outstanding, excellent for straightforward and complex cases, and we're giving our patients excellent visual acuity and outcomes from it. Um, I do think the next uh, kind of step in terms of the uh, pioneering of endothelial cell transplantation will be transplanting actual cells. Uh, so the work that Kinoshita uh, is doing uh, is certainly groundbreaking, and uh, to not potentially use uh, donor tissue, but instead uh, expand the endothelial cell uh, populations and implanting them, um, I think will uh, not only uh, maybe shorten and flatten the learning curve, uh, it will decrease the amount of donor tissue uh, that's needed, uh, but also it may allow for earlier intervention in these folks uh, who maybe, as Kathy talked about earlier, are very uh, interested in doing the less invasive approach. So I do think that's exciting technology in terms of the endothelial cell, tr cell transplantation. I think we'll probably see that as the next step in terms of evolution of technique. Sophie, what would be your you know, last take on it? Um, I totally agree with what um, Terry's comment. In the, looking in the future, uh, cell-based therapy uh, will, I think, will take over eventually. Uh, it will take the time to get to the regulatory affairs. Uh, but I think that, again, um, when I see all these beautiful techniques from everyone, um, I learn a lot from everyone as well. But I think the key thing is that uh, what you're comfortable with. Um, in our center, we have very complex cases, and I have no problem doing all this eyes with complex and tissue segments uh, using DMAC techniques, but I do also use DSAC as well in uh, ACLL, aphicic eyes. So I think that it, it is important to understand uh, the anatomy of the eyes and then the pros and cons of each techniques and then make the best outcome, uh, provide the best outcome to your patients. I think this is wonderful um, webinar that we have here. Elmer, what do you think? I mean, you think endothelial transplant is very close by, or it's it's you know far away in the future? No, I think there are going to be uh, continued advances. Uh, it, there's probably going to be cell-based therapy. There's going to be pharmaceuticals eventually that <clears throat> will supplant some of the things that we need to do. But I think perspective-wise, I mean, I, I think it's important that we uh, remain invested in all of these techniques because there are going to be roles for all of them, even PKP. Um, and one of the problems that other specialties are running into, retina, for example, they no longer are able to teach buckles, but there are still some patients who need buckles. So, you know, for some of us older surgeons, it's good to be around that we can still uh, transfer some of those techniques. But the important thing is not to lose that tail end uh, as we progress uh, over time. Benny, what would you want to say? I think Elmer, Elmer actually summed that up very nicely, which is what I was going to say, is that you still need to know how to do everything, all yep. the way back to PKP. We, you know, worldwide, still more PKPs are done than EKs, and we all know this. In the U.S., sometimes people forget that because EK is so popular. But we need to know how to do every technique. There's a role for every technique. I think cell-based therapy is the future. 
but I don't know. It's going to be definitely a few years at least before that um, gets over here. And until then, we just need to be careful uh, selecting the right technique for the right patient. Dr. Barry Lee is here, or I think he's he's there. Yes. Unmute, unmute. You'll have to unmute, Dr. Barry Lee. Yes. How's that? Yeah, perfect. <laughs> Sorry, I had to get in the car. I'm heading to clinic now, so wish okay. me luck. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. yeah, I think we'll summarize. I think one, you know, one thing from this webinar that's clear is that uh, the U.S. we need to we need to do better at, at PDEC. I think we're, our numbers, if you look at the statistical report, are still low on that. So hopefully we can get the I banks to help us more with that and and get our PDEC numbers up. But I think it was an excellent seminar. I learned a lot today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Vishal is there or Vishal is left? No, I'm Rajesh. right here. You're there? Yeah. I, well, you know, I agree with the, all the comments from the panelists. And, you know, it's it's pretty clear that all these techniques, although they are so diverse, they everyone seems to be getting excellent results from these techniques. And, you know, cell-based therapies and pharmaceutical treatments would be very useful for places like India and China where we don't have much graphs. You know, we didn't discuss that, but I guess it was uh, beyond the... Uh, the, the perspective of what we are discussing here. Um, all techniques, they work very well. So I would say when whatever floats your boat, uh, whatever is best for your patient, just keep on doing that uh, and keep on trying new things. Thank you. Rajesh? Uh, well, I guess uh, what uh, Vishal has uh, very nicely summed up everything. And... Uh, so I completely agree that till the time we get the cell-based therapy and pharmacological therapy, we'll continue having all these procedures. And every procedure has its own role to play, its own place. And uh, it was really nice to learn those tips from everyone uh, regarding uh, their procedure. And um, and that is how we are going to progress. And of course, uh, endothelial keratoplasty is going to progress much more than what it is at present. So, Amar, uh, how would you sum it up? I'd like to just, first of all, thank everybody who has come here to invite all of you people. So nice. All of you have stayed back for the whole two-hour symposium. I also want to thank the delegates from all over the world. I know a lot of questions I'm seeing who have been asking us so many questions from all over the world. I see them from Mexico, from South America, from United States. So many questions are coming in. I want to thank each one of you, and most important, Namrata, who's been the spearheading force with Gaurav Lutra, Rajesh Sena and Mahipal, all of you people who have done so much to educate all. Wish you all all the very best. Stay safe. And all delegates at home, we have got to win and we will win this battle. Don't worry about the virus. It'll all go away and we'll be back to square one, hugging each other once again. Thank you very much, everyone. Yeah. Thank you, Amar. Uh, we would like to thank all the speakers, all the delegates who are watching us. At and Jaswinder from JNG has done a great job once again. Thank you very much, Jaswinder. Johnson and Johnson, Justin and our team back in the AIOS headquarters, Mr. Kripal Rana and Raki for uh, coordinating everything. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Thanks, everyone.